I said, now that you mention it, I want to hear it in an English accent. But you can't even do it. You just can't do that long set of eyes. It just doesn't... I don't even... I don't know, Will, do you want to give it a go? Um, when yeah, it'd be like, cheat. <laughs> 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 oh, that was pretty good. <laughs> that was well worth it. Hi everyone, this is the latest Battles of Kingsgrave podcast. It's going to contain lots of spoilers for the HBO series The Wire, as well as possibly, incidentally, some stuff for the Song of Ice and Fire series. So today we are joined by three other guest podcasters. Um, so if you can all introduce yourselves in turn. First of all, uh, Michael. Hi, I'm uh, Mordian on the forums, or Michael uh, in real life. Duncan. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm Valkyris on the forums. And over to Will. Uh, yeah, hi, I'm the, the Parsnip Knight on the forums. <laughs> okay, so this is your first time podcasting. We just have to ask you the uh, the Parsnip Knight. <laughs> Any comments on the name? Well, it, it pretty much gives away my well, one of my favourite characters in the, the Song of Ice and Fire series. So um, it, it made sense when I was signing up. I don't know whether it makes sense going forward, but we'll see. <laughs> no, it's a great name in Avatar. And it's probably worth mentioning, it's the first podcast I've done since Podcast of Ice and Fire, of which we are an offshoot of an offshoot, won an award, so the Geeky Award. Um, oh, yeah. So congrats to the team, Mimi, Ashley, Kyle, and Amin, and all the previous hosts. It's a really great achievement. So at least we can say we're the bastard offshoot of an award-winning podcast now. Right, right exactly. Not yeah, just the bastards of any old person. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we're like a classy offshoot. <laughs> yeah, I'm one And one that met, got mentioned on George's blog as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That was actually almost, for me anyway, was sort of more exciting than the award itself. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. The fact that he took the time to do that. Um, yeah. It's just astoundingly cool. And I wonder if I'll get loads and loads of more listeners now that he's given it a shout-out. I really hope so. Anyone that follows George's blog, you would think, has already made the run of podcasts. Yeah, it's been a long time waiting. We have to fill our time somehow. So we're here today to talk about The Wire, which um, I'm so happy about, because for me, I think this is like the, the best TV series ever made. But I guess it's worth kind of going around the table and asking when everyone came to it, whether it was when it was airing or on box set. And also, I guess we all give it a bunch of lemon cakes out of five, five out of five. But which series maybe that you like best? Okay. I came to the show when it was airing in the UK. So it aired on um, FX in the UK. I didn't find it until they did a, they did like a second run of it. I think I found it. I'm one of those guys who likes to watch stuff from the start, so I saw that it was starting and they were, they were airing it every single week, and they aired it every single week for a year, like a year, I think, and then Series 5 then premiered. So I kind of watched Series 5 when it happened, but the rest of it I, I kind of I caught up on. As far as series go, I'm, I'm probably the controversial one. I, I like Season 2. I don't know why, it's just one of those ones that it just it just struck a chord with me, and it, the, the, some of the characters in that in that season just... Uh, they well, like they, they kill me to be quite honest. So, um, yeah, controversial opinion, ahoy. I don't know why you would be listening to this if you haven't already watched The Wire. But in case you are, season two seen as controversial because it's the one that doesn't take place predominantly on the corners in the drug culture of Baltimore. It takes place on the docks. Uh, yeah, it's certainly the most cont- self-contained season. And I love the ballsiness of yeah, we just made you get to know all these characters in season one and now. Episode one, season two. Here are a whole bunch of new characters. Right. <laughs> Deal yeah. with it. Uh, Michael, how about yeah. you? Um, I, I sort of the same thing for Song of Ice and Fire, actually. I, I tend to really like the season that got me into it, or the book that got me into it. Game of Thrones is my favorite, and so season one also is my uh, favorite season of the wire. Sort of for that reason, I guess. I, I just, um, it's the one that made me fall in love in the first place, sort of a thing. Duncan? Uh, yeah, I sort of watched it over a couple of years. I, I sort of watched the first two seasons on DVD in, like, 2007, I think. I just found them in a DVD store, and I was a big fan of Oz, and a lot of the same actors in, are in both series, so I watched those, and I loved them. But season three wasn't out on DVD for, like, a couple of years in Australia. Um, and I managed to catch, like, season four on late-night TV, so it was, like, so out of the loop, but I was so into it that I watched it anyway. 
Um, and then I finally got around to buying the last three DVDs uh, in like 2009. And then I rewatched the series with my dad in like 2010. And which is your favourite season? I can't divide between season three and four. It's one of those, but they're both amazing. Uh, wh- whatever what one I've watched last is my favourite. I mean, for me, because I, I didn't have FX, that's like a pay channel back in the day. So all I kept hearing from all the friends that I knew was that The Wire was this amazing thing. And I used to love The Sopranos, or I still love The Sopranos. And everyone used to say, oh, well, there's one se- one TV series that's even better than that, The Wire. So I finally got it on box set, I think, about five, four years ago. And I just watched it all the way through in about a month, watched it again. And it's just it's probably once mm. a year we just go through and watch it start to finish. And I actually, I really like season two as well, actually. There's just something so heartbreaking about that doc story and Frank. Um, trying to keep it together that's really affecting and then after that I would say probably season four the education season yeah. is just so heartbreaking but they're yeah. all good but I, I just um, while we're on the subject of like season ranking do any of you hate season five because some people have said that the whole nutty serial killer storyline jumped the shark I don't hate it, but I think it's the weakest. I think the journalism wasn't really fleshed out well. I mean, all the other season sort of arcs, whatever, whatever sort of institution they introduced were really well investigated. And I don't think the press was... I mean, it was okay. I, I like the character of Gus, but I mean, maybe it was because they only had 10 seasons, but I didn't think it was fleshed out as well as some of the other um, storylines. And yeah, the serial killer is a bit um, outlandish, but I think you could argue that of Amsterdam. Uh, but I think Amsterdam was so well portrayed it was like it seems uh, unrealistic on paper but it was so well executed whereas the serial killer plot seemed a bit crazy especially at the end where everything was sort of tied up neatly like i didn't really i thought it was a bit cute how they sort of set up all the characters as like replacements of bubbles and mcnulty and stuff that kind of rubbed me the wrong way but i, I love the bubble storyline in that season so i can't i can't be too hard on it yeah I, sort of the same sort of feeling I, I didn't hate it by any means but um it, it wasn't one of my favorite seasons i'd, I'd certainly agree yeah it, it's certainly i don't think i i i can't be sure but i don't think i've rewatched season five so i think that says everything mm. yeah that. really mm-hmm. yeah it's the one I, i've watched the least frequently i think it's weird that the journalism story is less fleshed out because david simon being right exactly. an yeah 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 it's almost like they had too much. They tried to stuff too much into it. They only had 10 episodes, mm. and they had to wrap up all of these storylines. And they tried to wedge this sort of homeless um, sort of investigation as well, and that wasn't really well explored either. So I don't know. I would have rather they not even go to the press, just sort of deal with all the characters they had at that point and try and yeah. wrap up their storylines. But, yeah, the bubble storyline, I mean, it's worth it for that. It's kind of at the oh, time I thought yeah. that nutty kind of serial killer storyline was ridiculous. But watching it in retrospect, it's kind of interesting how as the seasons had always incorporated stuff that was fairly outlandish. I mean, Amsterdam, definitely, although brilliantly done. But even, like, things yeah. like the Fuzzy Dunlop kind of storyline, the concept that, you know, cops in Baltimore, police, like, a, a, a living such a line of truth and... Um, delusion. Yeah. <laughs> well, some are, yeah. Well, some are. Some <laughs> <laughs> <Dirk. laughs> maybe more than others. Um, but it just, I guess, whatever it took. So I thought before we go into an in-depth discussion, maybe just like a, either a favourite character or a favourite quote or moment from each of us. A favourite character is too hard. <laughs> I think I think we can have two or three favourite characters, maybe. Okay, two or three, whatever. So we can just throw in. <laughs> we'll go McNulty on this. We'll just, we'll freestyle. So, Will? Prez is a favourite character of mine. It just, just from how much of a dick he is in the first series to how much uh, I just love him, uh, even from the second series when he when he gets way more involved in the in the investigation to the to the school system in series four, where he's just just amazing. He is he is a fantastic character. And then I guess I love I love the bunk. Um, <laughs> how can you not? How can you not love the bunk? Um, just it's the stories that him and McNulty come up with. It's it's bunk shooting the mouse in his home with his gun, <laughs> and, and and bunk turning up with his clothes burnt, and him lying in the in the in the tub. And it's bunk, wake up! Uh, uh, what are you doing? Hey, Jimmy. What are you doing? Where are your fucking clothes? Uh, pussy. Uh, mm-hmm. Or trace evidence. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You smell pussy? I don't smell no pussy no more. 
Hey, Bunk, I'll give you the burning trace evidence makes sense. What the fuck did you plan to wear home? Huh? It's all that kind of stuff that just makes me laugh. It's the image of Bunk playing lacrosse and scaring the prep school boys. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and like, it's, it's all the ad-libbing that the actor playing Bunk does. Like, you know, that scene in the bar when he says to McNulty, you know, your first time I treated you gentle. <laughs> and when he says to Lester Freeman, he makes a comment, like, at Lester Freeman when he walks in, when he says, Look at that bull-legged motherfucker. <laughs> I made him walk like that. I mean, <laughs> like that. So I'm I'm definitely bunk, but I'm also Omar. But I guess that's really predictable. Yeah. Omar wearing a tie in a courtroom. Yeah, the sort of cravat, almost sort of thing. <laughs> exactly. What exactly do you do for a living, Mr. Little? I rob drug dealers. Duncan, Michael, any? Okay, I was going to be boring as well. I mean, it's it's really McNulty, Omar. You know, those guys are both fantastic. Um, a more minor character that I really like is uh. Landsman, the homicide lieutenant. Oh yeah, Hard, whatever he is. <laughs> yeah, he's fantastic. I just love that guy. <laughs> he's also like secretly quite efficient manager of people. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I and mean, he's like he's not bad at, at his job. He seems like he's bad at his job, but he isn't really. You know, I mean, like he's playing the game and and doing like his job within the uh, obviously corrupt and broken structure or whatever. But he's also, I mean, like he's trying to solve murders too, right? I mean, like he. Um, certainly more than, like, the higher-up brass, he cares about what's going on. Oh, yeah, far more than a rules or someone like that. Right, exactly. Uh, yeah, he's hilarious. And um, also, yeah. you know, he has, he does all the um, the eulogies, doesn't he, in the bar? Mm-hmm, yeah. American, which are always just absolutely yeah. wonderful scenes. Yeah, yeah, he's a he's a great wordsmith. I loved his line about uh, the tweety impertinence of <laughs> Lester Freeman or whatever. For you, I would suggest some pantsu, perhaps muted in color, something to offset Detective Moreland's pinstripe lawyerly affectations and the brash tweety impertinence of Detective Freeman. <laughs> that is such a great line, tweety. Yeah, they give him the best literary lines. It's great. Duncan, any others or? So oh many. But I, I guess Bubbles, um, just because he's the shining ray of hope in the series, even at the darkest point, uh, he's just always smiling and hustling, and it's yeah, it's great to know he's out there. Cuddy, I really loved his um, storyline in season three, especially the the actor. I thought it was like a really moving, humanizing performance. Um, you want to bake a pie for Cuddy? For cu- <laughs> bake a pie for Cuddy. <laughs> What is it with the women of Baltimore that they all want to bake? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> bake pies yeah. for Cuffy. There's just something about yeah. it. He's so intense looking, you know? Brings out the mother yeah. instinct. Oh. But it's interesting, like, none of you have said string a bell, or not even me, and yet, like, a lot, of, I think for a lot of people, he's, like, one of the most iconic, or the most, um, in a perverse Yeah, yeah, I love style. string a bell as well, and Avon, and McNulty, and, uh... I like Slim Charles. He's kind of a minor character, but I think he has some cool moments in the series, and he's almost like the winner at the end because he's like the last man standing. Cool. So shall we uh, move on to a discussion of the season yeah, yeah. one of The Wire is... Basically, it's the neatest, isn't it? Because you just get introduced to the police crew that's going to be investigating the Barksdale drug crew, and you get to see it from the guys on the corner up to... Avon and Stringer who run the show but it's basically just that one case that's being prosecuted and you, and you kind of stick pretty close to it and as the series ends basically Wee Bay and D'Angelo Barksdale so the nephew of the Kingpin takes the fall so that's the, the through line um, I guess another reason uh, your your interest sort of uh, sparked something, another reason that season one is maybe my favorite is because I think I, I do tend to like the, the cops more than I like anybody else and so season one was really more police heavy, obviously, than. Uh... But also, like, because they're they're against the system. Like, I think um, most of the cop shows that you see on TV show cops basically being really efficient and having a lot of integrity. And if there's one corrupt one, it's all about. And he's a bad thing. guy. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas this, it's like the the basic presumption is that all the cops are either incompetent or career hungry, and that there are these this. <laughs> you know, four or five guys amongst a sea of humps who want to actually get shit done. And, yeah, you support them. And it's even wonderful when you see, like, a little scene where Sant'Angelo has a choice to shop McNulty to rules but decides to kind of keep that loyalty to his crew because they've helped him solve a case. Those are beautiful moments because it's like, that's our loyalty to this group of people. Right. You see during the season that if you buck the system, then you get you get punished. So the guys at the end, you get punished for McNulty, he gets to ride the boat, and then 
Daniels who's passed over for, for promotion, and they're, they're the guys who who cared probably the most by the end about the case. Freeman's a perfect example as well. So, and, the, and then the guys at the top don't want to know. I guess they want the case to be done and dusted as quickly as it can be, but it's it, it's not that easy. It almost it almost shows how screwed you are either way. That like these institutions just completely obliterate individuals. Either you try and buck the system and you completely get shut down or shut out. Or you abide by the system as D'Angelo did. Um, he took the years and he was completely screwed. So it, it, I, I think it has a pretty cynical view of um, institutions and, and capitalism and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. McNulty and D'Angelo are both prisoners of uh, inst- the institutions they serve. But what gets me about the police is not so much that it's corrupt, but how capricious it is. So, you know, at first, in, in sort of like the first episode or so, you really think Judge Phelan's going to be a friend of McNulty and help them to get shit through. And then, like, he makes this one, like, superbly crass comment about Rhonda. And um, you just realise... And then he kind of shops McNulty as well a little bit. And you just think, this guy's as much of a douche as rules in his own way. Like, it just sets up these people who you think might be the classic TV honourable guys in power and then just totally like wipes your legs from underneath you. Um, mm, yeah, I've heard them described as um, sort of like Greek gods just kind of toying with the humans below. Yeah, I think that's really... That's great, actually. Yeah, yeah, that as, great. As, a description of, as a description of Judge Phelan, especially. I mean, because he was totally... I mean, he was just sort of stirring things up for fun. You know, like he had... He had no real uh, buy-in to that. It was just sort of like, let's see what I can do. So in season one, um, did you think that, like, D'Angelo was going to take the fall that he did? Or did you think it was, when you were watching it, if you can remember watching it the first time, did you think it was going to be a classic, the case gets wrapped up, um, Avon, Stringer get taken out? Because I kind of did in my naivety. I guess I probably did. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not 100 percent sure, but I sort of probably thought that at least that Avon and Stringer would go down. I was just going to say I, d- I didn't really think in those terms at that point because by that point the the so-called bad guys or the criminals have been so humanized and they're so sympathetic that it wouldn't even seem fair for them to be locked up. It's almost like it's not a good guys bad guys things as it is with 99 percent of cop shows. It is this just society and these people sort of individuals trapped in these institutions and it wouldn't even seem logical for that that conclusion. Um, so I didn't even know what I was expecting at that point because it had veered so far away from all, all of the cliches of most cop dramas. It's like the song of like, uh, fire of cop shows. Every, everything matters. Yeah, there's no everything trajectory goes. you can map. I mean, but I guess to that extent, I mean, like, were you, would you say that you were rooting for the police or for the drug dealers or for no one or? In season one, I was rooting for the police. Exactly. But then, it, but then it gets more complicated because then by it does. season three, it's like, are you? It was kind of like I was rooting for Stringer versus Avon, and I was rooting for D'Angelo versus his family. But it gets so it gets so complicated. And despite all of this, and despite the fact that he does horrible shit, I always rooted for Omar to get away with it. Well, yeah. And there's this, like there's this <laughs> wonderful scene where Bunk like takes a, is it Bunk takes apart Omar at the end because they grow up yeah, and does. says yeah yeah look the, these kids who are imitating you because you're their Robin Hood have shot down these people and that's your fault because you've created this like mystique and I was like yeah that's bunk calling people like me out who've idealized Omar I guess the people who you want to succeed are bubbles that's and you want kind of like where's Wallace you want Wallace to succeed and you want Dookie to succeed but um yeah I mean the Wallace scene well I, I, the killing of Wallace and then the D'Angelo where the fuck is Wallace scene? And oh. that, that was so, oh so, God. so that powerful. Kills me. That, that going back to whether I thought they were going to imprison Avon and Stringer, I probably did after that scene. I thought that uh, D'Angelo had gone so far that he was going to give everything up, but I should have learned that that's not the way the game is played, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> to me, season one is like reading Game of Thrones. Like you, Even though you know the rules, yeah. are, it, it's so much more sophisticated and it's breaking rules, it's still a shock when Ned gets axed. There was still this kind of part of me that thought the bad guys, whoever they are, are going to get locked up at the end. And when that season went down, it's like, okay, we really are... You know, and season two, like the first few seasons, when you're like, oh my god, they're really going to leave McNulty on a boat for like this whole yeah. season <laughs> and bring him back into the shop. <laughs> okay, this is like a whole new way of telling the story now. <laughs> yeah. But like you said, I don't think I could even identify any sort of out and out bad guys in season one. Maybe in later seasons, like Marlo. I definitely wanted Marlo to fall, but yeah, I don't, I you know, you say you wanted Avon to be defeated, like captured and defeated, but 
you know, it's almost like the um, he's the devil you know. Like, it, it, I'd rather have Avon running things than Marlowe because Marlowe is just pure evil, whereas at least Stringer and Avon have this vague code, this vague sense of business over killing. I When I first time I watched it through, I really backed Stringer because, you know, I thought Stringer's trying to better himself. He's taking his community college classes. He's trying mm. to escape the environment that created him, and there's something admirable about that, even at the same time as he's doing really horrible stuff like sacrificing D'Angelo or this kind of slightly weird relationship he has with D'Angelo's ex. At the end of the day, I actually now think that sort of Avon is the more admirable because Avon at least gives a shit about his family in a very weird way. I don't think we ever really see Stringer demonstrate loyalty to anybody apart from Avon. No. He's He's, he's quite a cold character, right? He's a pure capitalist, yeah. But then, like, is that is that because we don't know as much about Stringer's history or family or anything like that? I don't remember hearing anything about those that side of him. And that's the point, right? He's an enigma. So when they finally yeah. get to his apartment, there's no personality there. Yeah. Um, so he's in a way he's a bit like Marlow. I mean, Marlow's like this kind of robo drug dealer. The more I think about Stringer, the more I think he's really quite sinister in some ways. Yeah, I mean, that's true. But at, at the same time, I mean, there was definitely, there was something about Stringer. I mean, you liked Stringer, you know, just as a as a person or whatever. He was sort of, you know, charming at least, I suppose. And Marlo wasn't, although I guess that's not really a particularly good good reason to vote <laughs> to, to choose them instead. But, you know, if you're going to, if you have to deal with a psychopath, I guess a charming one's a little bit better, right? <laughs> <laughs> Battles of King's Grave. We love our yeah. cats with a little bit of black. A little bit of charm. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder how much of that whole Stringer thing is. The character is written on the page. I'm sure. I think if you went back and read the script, he, come, he would come across as cold as Marlowe. I think the fact mm. that Chris Albert plays him. Yeah, I could. I, that's probably. I could definitely see that. Just adds a layer of flash. But um, oh my god, we have to talk about um, the scene where one of my favorite scenes in season one is the scene where. McNulty and Bunk go back and solve the... Uh, the oh, that's fantastic, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and it's good, just, not for the superficial reason that they use, like, variants on the F word, although that is genius. It's like, yeah. <laughs> but, like, but it's, it's a serious scene. Like, through that, you just see how good police they are, right? I mean... Exactly, yeah. Oh, fuck, motherfucker. I just think it's lovely to see it played out in the in the finale as well, when Weebay confesses to the to the shooting in exactly the same way as they 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 solved it when they were they were doing the investigation in the house. And as much as we feel bad for D'Angelo reading The Great Gatsby, at the end of the day, he did that. And I guess the other favourite scene from season one is when D'Angelo is like schooling Bodhi about um, chicken McNuggets. Do you think Mr. McDonald McDonald like paying the McNugget man? Here's a million dollars. <laughs> He's still in the basement somewhere thinking about a better way to make fries. <laughs> I love some of some of Wallace's lines are so creative. I think he says, um, "Let's nugget up that meat and make some real money," which is just a <laughs> strange construction of a sentence, but I love it. <laughs> like the, the language in the show is so creative. Yeah, and it just goes to show these guys. I mean, they're really super smart. I mean, D'Angelo, if he had have had any kind of education, he's a wise man. And when I look at Stringer and Avon's operation, I just think, my God, you know, if you guys had had MBA, you'd be investment bankers earning millions. But yeah, Stringer could go to Wall Street any time he wanted. It seemed. But well, I think this goes this goes back to um, uh, D'Angelo's line in season two when he's comparing himself to the Great Gatsby, and he's it's almost like you can't change who you are, like, you are what you are. And, and all of these characters, well, at least the most tortured characters, are these people who are trying to change what they are, and they can't, like McNulty and Stringer and Colvin to a point. They, they just can't change. Yeah, sorry. And that's in a way why I respect, I respect, well, not respect, I think Avon and D'Angelo are, in a way, smarter than Stringer because, you know, they recognise what they are, and... Mm. Avon says, I just want my corners. I'm just a gangster. Like, mm. he's saying something deep and meaningful to Stringer that, you know, you can try and play in the property deals and with people like Claire Davis, but they're going to run you over. And that's exactly what they do. So when we say Stringer could go to Wall Street anytime he likes, on a pure intelligence basis, yes, but he gets run over when he tries to enter that real world, doesn't he? That's true, yeah, yeah. He does, but I mean, to some extent, I mean, I, th- I think that there was, I mean, there's a learning curve, obviously. 
And, I mean, I think if he'd had more time there, he would have gotten his feet under him eventually. Well, I suppose, yeah, he... in, in fairness, it's a hard first opponent to come up against Clay Yeah. who's like the kind <laughs> of Gordon <laughs> Gecko of uh, yeah. politics. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he almost tries to go sort of too big too soon. Yeah, sort of unwilling to be the, the small fish again, kind of a thing. Yeah. Wanted yes. to, to jump right into being, like, you know, a power player in an arena that he'd never really played in before. What did you guys think of Daniels in Season 1? Yeah, I was actually just thinking that. I was reading some episode synopses while we were talking, and I was thinking, like, yeah, I didn't really like Daniels that much <laughs> in Season 1. I mean, especially compared to, like, how much I did like him later. But he was pretty much, you know, he was, he was basically, he was essentially a tool looking for promotion for like a good, what, two thirds of the season or something like that? It's weird thinking back to that. I had exactly the same thought. And yeah, he's just the guy in charge, isn't he? He's just, he just kind of, he's the guy who's playing by the rules, I guess. And, yeah, drugs and, on the table, and, or dope on the uh, damn table or whatever. Uh, yeah, and he's the guy who has to go and, yeah, he has to go and do the raids when he, when he knows that, that he doesn't, there's going to be nothing there, but he has to do it because he's being told. He's the guy who follows orders and, Gets the team to do what they need to do. And we, do we ever find out what he did back in the day? Like, because he did something dodgy, didn't he? Yeah, I mean, it's implied over and over, but I don't think we ever know, do we? No, I don't uh, think, I think it's, it's something in the Eastern something, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Something in Ephesus. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess his story is, is his character arc is one of like escaping that corruption, which is symbolised by drifting apart from his very careerist life. Cool. Time to move to season two. What do you guys reckon? Sure. You know what the trouble is, Brucey? We used to make shit in this country, build shit. Now we just put our hand in the next guy's pocket. So yeah, yeah. season two is the docks. So basically, Valchek, who's Prez's kind of really dodgy father-in-law cop basically out of sheer vanity because he's donated a stained glass window to his local Catholic church and realises that Frank Sabotka of the Dock Workers Union has already donated an even more impressive one. Just basically, on a total whim, gets the police to investigate the unions and he doesn't even know if they're doing anything wrong, but he just wants something to be pinned on them. And so having been opposed to that little uh, investigative force, now it becomes their sponsor. And I guess back on the corners we have Stringer, taking care of the D'Angelo problem um, and making a deal with Prop Joe. So that's it's kind of like the start of the end of the Stringer Avon us against the world attitude. And of course, yeah, McNulty, uh, we get the, the big introduction of Beattie as a character. He's like a genuinely good cop who works on the docks and gets drawn into the investigation too. Yeah, she's, she's an interesting character because I don't think she actually really does anything wrong ever, does she? No, she's just a straightforward, uh, honest yeah. woman and good wa- good mother, and she almost makes yeah. a man out of McNulty, right? Which is impossible. Yeah, it's it's in this show, it's actually an oddity to have a character that that good of heart who doesn't really do anything at all dubious ever. And I guess, I mean, the she's she's almost the only one who's not on uh, some sort of crusade, either trying to get promoted or trying to accomplish something or whatever. She just wants to. I mean, she's basically she's doing her job. And she's, you know, looking after her children, and, you know, she doesn't really want anything else, I don't think. She kind of, I guess she kind of wants to get involved in, I guess, proper police work that she doesn't I get mean, involved I, in I too much at the dock. That's true, but I sort of, I still like, I guess, I don't know, I feel like it's, that's, it's not a crusade for her in the way that, like, Rawls wants to get promoted, or, like, McNulty wants to, you know, do something and finish something. I was yeah. I was kind of under the impression yeah. that she yeah, kind of, didn't even want to be a cop. She just did it because it paid well. That's what she said. She tells Bunk I agree. to support her kids. She's not what you call natural police. No. She's no, no. Human. But she's just effective and good. And she's also one of the rare depictions of a woman who isn't like like domineering in a sort of partner or mother role. Like, you have these really horrible mothers, like Naimon's mum and D'Angelo's mum, and yeah. it's really sort of like Lady Macbeth wives, like um, Cedric's wife, but she's just a genuinely nurturing mother. It's <laughs> like nobody else like <laughs> the series. It's I guess, um, what's his name, uh, Carcetti's wife is, I mean, she's a much more minor character, but she's okay, right? She doesn't really do anything bad. Well, this was sort of one of the criticisms of The Wire, that the female characters are pretty marginal, apart from Kima, who obviously skews a lot of, um, female stereotypes, but a lot of the wives and girlfriends are pretty marginal and they're not particularly flattering portrayals for the most part. Well, David Simons admitted that he found writing women quite hard, so he'd just basically write men with tits. So <laughs> Kima's basically a man, like she kind of has the classic man 
nervousness at becoming a father, so to say, and having a fair. Mm. She's just classic. She's a McNulty, basically, without the drinking problem and the tendency to create serial killers. And, <laughs> and even, like, Ronnie, I think Ron's is, like, a really interesting character because typically when you see these career women on TV, they're always, it's the classic thing, it's like they're professionally success, successful, but personally falling apart. And I love the fact that she never talks about her biological clock ticking. She kind of very sensibly moves on from McNulty to Daniel. She's just like totally in control. I don't think there was a big female writing presence on the show either. I think it was very male driven from a writing perspective. So that might have, might come into it as well. And all like really yeah. famous crime writers as well. The writing staff was insane, wasn't it? It was like George Pelicanos and like Dennis Lehane and people. That's why it's a novel. <laughs> <laughs> on TV. <laughs> Yes, it's Dickens, right? It's the Baltimore Dickens. Yeah. That's <laughs> The season two, man, Frank the Bug breaks my heart because he does everything wrong for the right reasons. He's yeah. such an honourable yeah. man. It's it's Shakespearean. It's oh, he's horrible. He is yeah. Him him going to meet the Greek is just it's heartbreaking. And I'm not even Greek. My name is not my name, and you? To them, you're only the Greek. And of course, I'm not even Greek. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's um. But is he delusional? Is he like a King Lear sort of not King Lear, like um a Don Quixote character, like fighting a battle that's already lost? I mean, it, it's so sad. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that that's true. He is sort of uh, definitely a, a fighting in a yeah a sort of a blowout that he hasn't realized is a blowout yet i mean it's it's all moving away and he's just ain't never going to be what it was right yeah but i guess he's his life is the docks isn't it so he's he's yeah exactly. forever tied to them isn't he he's yeah. and i i i love him because he's not he's not trying to be greedy he's for himself he's trying to defund his goals of the union and the docks it's oh frank sabaka and even when yeah, well, he's like when you think there might be some ego like Maybe he does it because he loves being the big man who doles out the money at the bar for, you know, have have this bit of cash on Frank Sabodka and he knows you're in trouble. But it's not. You get the feeling it just mm. really is selfless. He's not not trying to gain money and and buy houses or buy cars or anything. He's just trying to trying to be a good guy. And yet, not parenting Ziggy massively well. Want to see? Oh uh, <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, not not a natural father. I don't think really. Uh... Ziggy Sabodka, the duck. What kind of fool would give a duck whiskey anyhow? Yeah, the duck. I think the Ziggy Sabotka character arc, going from this kind of quite foolish figure of fun, very reckless, into this guy who finally snaps and then commits this heinous crime and then finally is just this pathetic character behind bars who you just think, oh my God, he's going to really suffer in prison. It's one of the best single season character arcs in the wire. I think the Prez character arc is brilliant over the seasons. But Ziggy in that one season is just amazing where they take him. I was just going to say, on paper, I think it does. It is an interesting storyline, but I think Ziggy is so insufferable that I just don't <laughs> enjoy watching him. He's just like almost um, unrealistically idiotic. Well, more so than Huck. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's another question for the end show, isn't it? Like, who's the biggest idiot in the wild? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I don't understand that. The complete hatred of Ziggy. I mean, he breaks down after he after he does the shootings. Is is uh, in the car. It's, it's just uh, it's heartbreaking, really. When he realizes what he's done and and wh- where he's going to go now, it's just it's just yeah. That's yeah, no, I, I definitely have sympathy for him, but it's just it's problems of his own making, and he keeps making the same problems over and over again to the point where you just like want to shake his neck. Oh, you do, but then isn't that because of how he's how he's grown up and and the, I guess the lack of attention he's got and, and all, all all the I guess everything him being the butt of everybody's jokes isn't it that, isn't that what he says yeah he's just a guy who's screaming out for he sees his father being a father to the whole doc to everybody but to him and if you look at his relationship with his cousin Nikki I mean he almost has or uses Nikki a little bit like a paternal relationship I think he kind of has to put some of the blame at Frank's door I've got some time for Ziggy I've, I've met some characters a little bit like that. I think it's not completely outlandish. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's a... I mean, obviously, it's a little over the top. I mean, it's a TV show at the end of the day, but um, I, I've definitely... I've, I've known people who were kind of like him, and I don't think that that helped me like Ziggy anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, it's, 
it's uh, it's it's I it's like he is a, is annoying for me to to watch most of the time. And I mean, I do feel sympathy for him, but most of the time he's just irritating. What about Nikki Sabutka, the white kid who tries to sell drugs? I just love how like Herc and Carve are so dismissive of like, oh my god, these guys are so incompetent. And when is it Herc arg- arguing for um positive discrimination for white kids trying to sell drugs? Yeah, that was great. Yeah. <laughs> What did you all make of Prop Joe when he turns up in season two? Or was he just so quiet you didn't even notice him too much? I got motherfucking nephews and in-laws fucking all my shit up all the time. And it ain't like I can pop a cap in the ass and I hear about it Thanksgiving time. For real. I'm living life with some burdensome niggas. Yeah, I don't think I really noticed Prop Joe for the first couple of seasons at least. And I, I really, you know, wound up liking him a lot, but... Yeah, he was he was sort of too quiet for me to to really uh, get in too much. Yeah, I think you, I think you notice him, but you don't you don't realize what he's gonna or who he's gonna become in the show. So you don't. I guess you 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 understand, or you I guess you try to understand his position in the in the show, and then and then you kind of think, well, I'll put him in my back of my mind because he's not actually the lead or any of the lead characters in the in the season. Yeah, you, you yeah. just identify him with East Side, and the story's about West Side. So you think, okay, that's the main guy in East Side, but we don't really need to worry about him too much, other than when he's dealing with Avon. And then, like my other, my sort of another random question. You know, the guy at the FBI that McNulty sort of goes to help for. Do you? Fitz. Think, mm. Yeah, Fitz. And then there's the other guy who's got a Greek name, whose name I now completely figure out. I'm blanking. Oh, uh, yeah. Do you think uh, he's uh, in on it with the Greeks, or do you think that? it's genuinely true that he's just letting them get away with it because they're giving him terrorist information or tip-offs. Yeah, yeah. I know who you're talking about. Um, well, that that seemed to be the case. That's what we what we saw. Okay. No crackpot theories then. Good stuff. Well, I don't know. He seems to pass on the information very, very quickly about Frank Sabaka. So, uh, Yeah, I mean, it's... I don't know. I mean, I guess there's... Is there, to some extent, is... Where is the line kind of between getting bribed and and doing your job, right? Like if they're giving you like these major busts or whatever, like is that a bribe or is it doing your job? I mean, it it could kind of go either way depending on you know the what you're doing with the information they give you. Like I feel like if he's certainly not an alt, I don't think he's like an altruistic like the bureau means everything to me sort of character, right? I mean, he's not like no, these guys are more helpful than they are harmful to the country, therefore I'm on their side. I mean, I think he's definitely like, these guys are advancing my career, right? Like, I need their information to help my career, therefore I don't give a shit about this drug stuff. I think if you read it as the, what Fitz suggests, that they're that the, um, the Greeks are actually helping them, it shows the sort of disparity between... Uh, the two institutions, the the city police and the FBI, that the, that the city that the FBI actually value um, the security of the nation as a whole. Like they're they're they see the terrorists as a greater threat than the actual you know what would we what the show argues is the far more dangerous threat, threat which is the crime within the country and the, and the and the drug dealers that are actually killing heaps of people as opposed to the terrorists who are um, probably not 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 so much. Yeah, I think that's shown throughout the series that, that the yeah. FBI value terrorism more and, and that funds or cases are always diverted towards terrorism cases within yeah. the FBI rather than, rather than drugs. I love how every time Fitz appears, he has to give that spiel about we, we only focus on, um, on yeah. terrorists now. Dr- yeah, it's basically the right. same speech every time. <laughs> every time he get, we see him, he gives that speech. It's yeah. a post, post-9-11 speech, I guess, isn't it? But uh, yeah, definitely. Well, it's sort of the show be, um, was started in the wake of 9/11. I think it was 2002 that it first started, and I think it shows what um, David Simon talks about the sort of end of the American Empire. That sort of empires are never destroyed from like an external force. We fear the terrorists so greatly, but in reality, it's kind of rotting from the inside with all of these cities overrun with crime and, and being abandoned. Yeah, I agree with that. It's it's in a corruption, right? Um... And it's so complete here. That's why it's amazing that BD kind of doesn't get corrupted. She's one of the very few. Anything else in season two? I'm trying to think what's happening on the corners. So you've got Stringer basically yeah. progressively streets, taking over, right? The streets take a back seat, I think, this season, yeah. 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 I mean, they do a little bit, but then you've got people, I mean, you've got Brother Mazone turning up and 
Oh. The first thing he does is shoot cheese, which is always <laughs> no, good. good. <laughs> <laughs> Only he's shot cheese in the face. I think I think specifically the first thing he does is send out his henchmen to go and get him a copy of Atlantic Monthly. You know what the most dangerous thing in America is, right? Nigger with a library card. <laughs> I love how like the um the most hardcore badass in the series, well that's to be debated. But Omar's like openly homosexual, which is like two things up to the classic macho sort of stereotypes. And you've got brother Muzone sending out for Harper's. <laughs> right. <laughs> Makes me happy. Yeah, I, I thought I thought he might have stretched a, stretched reality a little bit. He seemed a little too cartoonish for this show. I, I enjoyed him and his role, but yeah, I think that was probably the character that pushed it, pushed the show. Uh, it's the realism of the show to its limits. I guess I guess the good thing is he doesn't actually turn up that much. He's just in it a little bit, and then he goes away, and then he comes back for a little bit, and then goes away again. He's not like he's if he was one of the more central characters. He, if he was the Omar of the show, that might mm. be a bit more of a problem. Yeah, I, I agree yeah. with that. I, I think that maybe he's a little too uh, one-dimensional if he was a a, a main or a recurring uh, main sort of character, but as just like an in-and-out uh, kind of character, I think it's okay. Cool. So maybe over to season three. Um, um, oh, oh, I guess we're. I guess we're. Uh, D'Angelo's death. Maybe. Oh, yeah. Okay. Death. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's kind of big. Before we go on to season three. <laughs> yeah. Go for it. <laughs> Um, well, I, I mean, I, I just, just, just the fact. That I guess it's the cover up of it, and it's, it's Stringer's involvement, and it's, it's this, it's the, it's the key, it's one of the key moments in the, in the Avon Stringer relationship down the line, and that, that's, it's important for the show, in, se- in season three, that, that, that it happens in the way that, that it does. It's also, I think, it's an important marker for the show that it let. D'Angelo die because yeah. I think up to that point he's probably one of everyone's favourite characters from the corners and that it's the killing Ned Stark moment all bets are off at that point. It is, but then I guess I guess the question is what what, what could oh what what could they, what would they've done out with, with him afterwards if they hadn't have killed him where where would his arc have gone? It's a different show, I guess. He it's, he would have um, turned state's evidence or something, I guess. I don't I don't see an arc for him apart from death, to be honest. Yeah, he was really morbidly at that point. Yeah, you and Stringer both, right? Um... (laughs) (laughs) Oh, fun. (laughs) (laughs) It's savage, but it's true. My only sort of moment of doubt over the D'Angelo storyline is when he was going to flip on the family, right? And then his mum comes in and kind of manipulates him into taking the years. At that point, he'd become such a strong independent sort of, he he had such clear vision of what this was doing to him and how it was operating and how evil it all was. I really thought he was going to have the strength to, to, to back out, but he evidently didn't. I just never quite thought that his mum would get to him the way she did. Yeah, I mean, it's it's certainly disappointing, but I mean, it, I do, you know, I mean, your mom's your mom, and it's hard to, it's hard to, to really, really, you know, like, turn your back on, and it's, you know, it's not just, like, your whole life, but I mean, like, stuff that she's been, you know, that your parents or your family's been drumming into you since you were a kid, and she's sort of the, uh, the whole representation of that. Yeah, now that you mention it, it is a little bizarre that he, he was able to see so clearly how bad his situation was, yet in one conversation his mother was able to turn it around. I guess it shows how powerful family is for him. And for the Bartsdales in, in general, I mean, I like yeah. to think that when Avon goes batshit crazy at Stringer about the D'Angelo murder, that it wasn't just because Stringer had done something without his authority, but it was because it was family and that's the difference between Avon and, and Stringer. Yeah, well, I, Avon hung him out to try, but I think he definitely loved D. I think if the situations were reversed and Avon had to take some time to save his mum and D and the rest of the family, that he would have done it. But maybe that's going too far. <laughs> Actually, as I say it, I think that's going too far. <laughs> Poor D'Angelo. No. Yeah. yeah. Poor D'Angelo. I feel bad. I guess. Moment I guess. <laughs> Sorry, not of all but it's everyone will speak. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I feel bad uh, real quick before we move on to three. I also feel bad for Nikki. Like, I really thought, I think, um, watching this the first time, I really thought Nick uh, was going to push on through, was, was going to, like, you know, become someone himself and make a deal with the Greeks and, and whatever. But Nikki ends up okay, right? He's not off, does he? Yeah. Uh, do we... What's my memory? He's, he's in witness protection. Yeah, but, but so, okay. sort of. But then he goes back to work, so I don't really know how that worked in the end. He's like, yeah. what? Yeah. Like, stay away, people. 
Yeah, and he, yeah. Kind of, he kind of ends out of Baltimore. Do not come back. <laughs> and he kind of ends up because he ends up in the in the closing montage, doesn't he? Kind of looking through the chain link fence, and I almost thought, uh, oh, somebody's going to like off him in the back of the head as he does this, but it didn't happen. So I, yeah. I guess he's but, okay. Yeah, I, I mean, think like Wallace. Sorry, I think like Wallace. He this is how they they identify themselves, like as men, as providers. They identify themselves as stevedores, and if they're not that, they're nothing. But yeah, Sorry, I think you're right. And th- there seems to be something really magnetic about Baltimore, like as much as we think of it as a prison for characters that, you know, Wallace needs to get back to it, Nikki's drawn back. There's that really hilarious scene, like it's comedy, where um, Bodie has to go out of town to buy the disposable cell phones. Yeah. And he's like, mm. <laughs> they have different radio stations out here. Yeah. What's that about? Like, I've never... And he's listening to like a religious channel for like the whole day or something. <laughs> He, he, was the to, uh, he was listening to Prairie Home Companion at one point. Come on, man, man, you kill him, you kill him, stop. It's been perfect tomato weather out there, these wonderful hot humid days and that rain at night, thunderstorm. It's a Philly station. Oh, would anybody ever want to leave Baltimore? That's what I'm asking. So there's something about Baltimore that people can't seem to escape, even if when, when, even when given an, an exit route. Yeah. Um, but I didn't have that much sympathy for Nicky. He was just like a. I don't think he was because he was always he was always the straight man against Ziggy, so he never had the charisma to hold my attention too much. I see. I mean, that, that's sort of the thing. I hate I, Ziggy was so irritating <laughs> that I. That I couldn't help but identify with Nick. Uh, so yeah, he was. He also looked like a bit of a younger pastiche version of Ben Affleck. <laughs> <laughs> In sort of you know Clark's not Clark's chasing Amy or something like that. Um, more rats maybe. Yeah, I could see that. Okay, on to season three. When you walk through the corner, you gotta watch your back. back definitely with the police versus the drug dealers we've got the new senior policeman bunny colvin who unlike rules actually seems to give a fuck about stuff and he has this crazy idea that he's going to isolate all the drug dealing into one part of the city so that at least the rest can be crime free called Amsterdam, which basically is hell on earth but he keeps it a secret for a surprisingly long time and the crime stats all fall and then on the drug side, you've got Barksdale clan versus Marlowe Stansfield, who's the new kid on the block. You've got the rehabilitation of Cutty. Um, we've got Tommy Carr Ketty um, with his political campaign for mayor. And you've got, oh, my goodness, the amazing psychological duel between Stringer Bell and Avon Barksdale. Mm, yeah. so, so much going on this season. It's, it's amazing. So Bunny Colvin, the one good senior cop he's just a nice guy right there's no shade to bunny colvin no bunny's just a good guy there's shade to that yeah. amsterdam idea you could like argue it either way but he's just a good guy yeah yeah but i guess you get you go back to you come back to season one don't you and you buck the system and you get punished <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah you can't win well, uh, what, what did you guys think of the amsterdam idea like was it positive or negative or could you see it working uh i mean i i'm i'm a legalization uh, person, so yeah, I, I think it's a fantastic idea. I, I mean, personally, obviously, it would be. I think it would be better if it were not, you know, uh, criminals. Still, I think uh, more total legalization would be better. But I don't want to get into a whole, you know, political thing. <laughs> I think one thing that struck me was how it sort of centralized the problem, and they could actually take um, solutions to that problem, like uh, doctors and you know, uh, clean needle exchanges, um, straight to the addicts, like. And um, as long as there was no violence, it could be sort of contained. And um, and obviously it, it sort of drew all the violence and the horror away from communities. Um, so I think there was a lot of positivity, even though the actual places were almost nightmarish. Um, I think, you know, yeah, there, it was positive in general. Yeah, and that's, that's pretty much what I was going to say, to be quite honest. I think you did see the positives and you did see 
I think the it's more of the communities I think that that I found affecting just the fact that they got people off the corners and people could go on there, come out their front doors knowing that there wasn't going to be things happening. It, it kind of that that felt to me the biggest positive for the just for the the area. Um, and I know that the, the fringe benefits that came. I, I really love the um, the speech that Colvin gives to uh, Carver. I think it's episode ten, maybe or eight, where he's talking about how the drug thing ruined police work and how people are so obsessed yeah. with stats. And 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 well, I've, hang on, I've got the quote here. Um, yeah, once you once you call a thing a war, everyone starts running around acting like warriors, and the community that you're supposed to protect is just occupied territory. And I think that really captures the frustrations and the failure of the drug war. You heroic motherfuckers kill me. Fighting the war on drugs. One brutality case at a time. Girl, you can't even call this shit a war. Why not? Wars end. And one of the things I think you see with Amsterdam is that cops actually get back to doing police work. They get to walking a beat. Um, actually being in dialogue with community rather than fighting them, rather than jacking people for possessing grams of coke. They're, you know, I think at the end you see some guy being arrested for church robberies. I don't know. I mean, I'm really conflicted on Amsterdam. On the one hand, when you heard it being talked about in the, abs- in the abstract, it seemed like such a good idea and seeing the good on the streets. And also the good on the cops, because policing drugs made the cops corrupt, right? Like busting heads yeah. and not. But then that scene that they show, the cinematography of it, the way they did the production design of Amsterdam, and it just feels like some kind of hell on earth. It was just terrific. And I thought it sums up because that it just made explicit what's implicit in the way the policing is done in The Wire, which is effectively that the Western world has decided to just abandon this certain kind of underclass of people and just leave yeah. them to like shoot up and just die their own death. And that's really implicit in the way that drugs are policed. But Amsterdam, it was kind of like, you guys just get on. Like, because, of course, when Amsterdam's set up, they don't have the needle vans and stuff. That's why people get upset about it. It literally is just ring fencing these guys in an area and saying, right, just kill yourselves quickly. Um, and, of course, that's not what Bunny Corbin wants. But that basically is the, you know, you are explicitly just leaving people. I mean, I suppose that's true, but I mean, it's it's really no different than, I mean, it was just spread out in, you know, a thousand different pockets all over the city before. I mean, now it is concentrated, which, you know, obviously it it does present this sort of hellscape sort of, uh, sort of a thing. But I, I really don't think that there was anyone doing anything that they hadn't been doing before. Oh, yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I, it's just making and, explicit what was implicit by putting it in one place. It, I suppose, it, it yeah. just made it shocking to me because I really saw for the first time this is what this is what that policing basically is. The, 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 the reality the show depicts is um, there's no easy answers, but I, I don't think you know uh, treating drug addicts as criminals is, is good as the show. Yeah, for sure, and there has to be a happy, sensible balance somewhere between the two, I guess. But, um, yeah. God bless Bunny Hot Colvin for trying, though. Poor oh, Bunny. <laughs> Are we assuming that this hasn't been tried anywhere? I'm assuming it hasn't, but I don't know where the idea comes from. Amsterdam. Well, yeah, but <laughs> I don't. I don't know if there's if there's but any. But Amsterdam is just soft drugs in coffee shops, right? I mean, yeah. yeah. But you mean like a free zone within a place where it's illegal? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't think it... Um, I don't, David Simon said it's not based on anything in particular, I don't think. Oh, okay. It's never been tried, and as the, the, the guy at the end, the, the drug czar of America says, there's no place in America, a ge- geological entity where drugs are legal. Uh, Portugal has basically decriminalized almost everything, is my understanding, in the same way that like a lot of American states, anyway, if, if, well, I mean, some American states have outright legalized marijuana, but... Other places have sort of decriminalized small amounts or whatever, but Portugal, my understanding, has decriminalized basically small amounts of anything. Actually, I think David Simon was talking about the decriminalization of marijuana as intrinsically racist. There's definitely racism in American drug laws, um, although, I mean, the comparison I always hear is like the difference between uh, mandatory minimums for powder cocaine and crack cocaine. Yeah, because for sure. Powder cocaine is a white drug and crack cocaine is a black drug. Is Marlowe Stanfield Stanfield? 
a psychopath? Yeah. I mean, I don't. I mean, I think so. And in terms of like the way I would ever use that word, like talking about a character in a book, I think so. I mean, I'm not a you know psychiatrist, and I can't diagnose people or whatever. But but I think yeah, absolutely. In terms of uh, kind of lacking a fictional, empathy, a fictional character. Yeah, exactly. He has no his. Yeah, his performance is chilling. He reminds me of, like, you know, Bruce Bolton talking in a low voice the whole time. Yeah, yeah. that's so true, actually. I didn't think of that before. He's, he never loses control, right? Except for that final scene. Except for that yeah. final scene. But he's Which is great, so yeah. contained. It's kind of like the anti-charisma charisma. It also just um, it emphasized to me how competitive that drug trade is, that, you know, Stringer and Avon are quite young at that point and have established so much, and yet... Marlowe is what how old like early 20s? 22 I think yeah yeah and yeah. he's he's like the next the kids are coming up from behind in the world's of LCD sound system I mean it's um <laughs> it's uh it's crazy like your 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 shelf life I mean for a hopper I guess is what you're dead at 17 or something but yeah. but even these kingpins like and it also as the seasons went on it just made me realize just how intelligent prop Joe was that he managed to stay alive throughout the whole thing and reach a relatively old age for a drug dealer. Yeah, yeah I think what, what Stringer and Joe tried to accomplish with the co-op was kind of honourable in a way, and, and Marlowe just set fire to it all. So he's definitely the villain of the series for me. In a way, it's sort of par- I mean, the co-op thing sort of parallels the Bunny Colvin's Hamsterdam as well as a sort of like a way to try to take the violence out of the, of the drug trade and make it more civilised. There's that. But it's so funny, like, there's that meeting where they have the first cult meeting at some, like, shitty, like, Kilton Hotel or whatever, or some yeah. hotel. You know, I think someone's got a book on how to chair a debate. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, hands up if you want to speak. And then Stringer turns to this kid and is like, are you taking notes at a criminal fucking conspiracy? <laughs> <laughs> are you taking notes? That was great. <laughs> yeah. I love, in the, I love in the first scene where they have point of order and they have to, like, recognize the chair and all that. That was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> it was That's cool. hilarious. Um, but you're totally right. I hadn't really thought of it before, but it's a total analogy to Amsterdam. Let's, let's make this clean. Let's make this efficient. Let's, right. We all know what we have to do, so let's just play the game with as minimum possible collateral damage as possible. It's very and, because, and because violence brings the police, that's the whole point. So why does Marlowe blow it up? Marlowe, who's so efficient and cold and rational. He wants to be the king. He wants to wear the crown. He wants to be like, he, he, he loves that idea of um, power. I just want my corners. Yeah. And is that, I wonder if that's his immaturity or whether it's just him. I mean, he's a bit like Avon in that respect. Avon wouldn't have been done with a co-op. It's the difference with... I don't know if this show went into Marlowe's background, where how he came up. I don't, I don't, I don't think he came up through the ranks, really. Like, I, I would assume an Avon would have done it, the whole raft of roles within an organisation, but I, I can't imagine that Marlowe... But Avon's like... An, he's inherited wealth, isn't he? Because isn't there that one scene where... Um, D'Angelo's mum says something about being like third generation drug dealing. I, I don't think you can really rise through the ranks. I think, as um, D'Angelo says, the king is always the king. See this? This the king pen, all right? And he the man. You get the other dude's king, you got the game. All right, what about them little bald headed bitches right there? All right, these right here, these are the pawns. They like the soldiers. So how do you get to be the king? It ain't like that. See, the king, stay the king, all right? Anything stay who he is. So even if he's low down and he only has a small crew, he's always the leader and he builds it up. So I think Avon and Stringer would have built it up from the beginning as the as the king. And same with Marlowe. I mean, I think he's David Simon based him on an actual person who was a, a gang leader with about 50 members, and he just took over corners with extreme violence. So I think that they they always start as the leader of their small crew, and then they just build it up from there and take corners as they go. Yeah, like I, like someone like someone like Bodhi could never actually I don't think get to be king. I mean, the the one exception might be um, Slim Charles, who is able to rise through the ranks and achieve a level of authority within the co-op. But that's kind of a special circumstances. And what did he think about his final kind of flipping out when he finally loses it? I don't. Know, I guess. I mean, in the sense that all Marlowe wants is to be, you know, to be the king, to be the 
you know, person in charge. I think it's sort of like when he sort of accidentally steps into, you know, what Stringer Bell was, was looking for the whole time. When he accidentally steps into that bigger pond, then all of a sudden he's a small fish again and he doesn't want to be a small fish. He wanted to be, mm. you know, the big <laughs> fish in his pond. And then all of a sudden he's in this other damn pond that he doesn't know what to do with and sort of, you know, almost finds himself back at square one. Just can't That's a great, yeah. That's a, That's a great point. I like that, yeah. Okay, so should we move to the Stringer versus Avon betrayal? The sort of dual betrayal at the end, and they're, they're both trying to pull the drug trade in different directions. Stringer wants to reform it, and obviously Avon wants to keep his corners and then and rule as a king, basically, in the West Side. And Avon's ultimately right, right? I mean, as much as we applaud Stringer trying to make it cleaner, he's, yeah. he's playing in a game he can't win. And Avon understands the brutality of it and isn't ashamed of it in a way that Stringer maybe is. Stringer is right in a philosophical sense, but Avon is right in like the real pragmatic sense. Like he, Marlowe is a threat that cannot be deal, dealt with in like a cooperative manner. He has to be destroyed. He's never going to give up until he, until he's the king. And yeah. if Stringer had have dealt with him quickly, a lot of people would have lived. I, yeah, I also think, as we mentioned in season two, the revelation about D'Angelo's fate really hurt their relationship and led to the bitterness between them. So it wasn't just about business, it was this emotional connection that had been severed and it just built and built and built until the end where they just sort of betrayed each other. There's that one bit where they're um, is it in Avon's apartment and they're both standing on the balcony and having this whole yeah. conversation where... Yeah. Each one knows that the other one knows, and we know, and yet it's never said. And they just talk about the old days and just, you know, yeah. like forget about everything and just think back. And it's so moving. Yeah. That's one of my favorite scenes in the whole series, yeah. And beautifully shot. You think the characters are almost getting to a point where they're happy with their place in the world, in that they're, they're in this apartment looking over the i think it's the marina isn't it where they are yeah on the water and uh, yeah and, and they, they're kind of risen to those points but you know that avon's uh, deeply unhappy about the situation and you know that stringer wants more and more and more and it's it's almost sad that they they've got to this place where they should be happy and yet they're completely unhappy with each other and the yeah. situation and their lives and they and they know they betrayed each other at that point, and it's they're just pretending to be friends at that point and reminiscing about old times. And you can see how unhappy Stringer is when he, I think he's talking about if only I bought those properties, I would have been rich by now. And he's just yeah. you can see how un, un, unhappy he is with his current life. He just doesn't want to be here anymore. But it's just there's something really brutal about Avon in those final scenes where. He says about he says to Stringer, you know, Clay Davis saw your ghetto ass coming or whatever it was, and mm, yeah. he really he really fells Stringer at the end. He says that, and he makes another comment about when Stringer starts sort of waxing lyrical about if I'd have had the money I had now back in the days, I could have, you know, bought the yeah. waterfront property before it became the waterfront. Like he's thinking so big with his real estate speculation, and and Avon's just cutting him down psychologically. He's really undermining him. Because basically, Avon just judges power in a very simplistic way, which is, how many corners do I have and how secure they are? So all he sees when he looks at Stringer is the guy who got him into this stupid war with Marlowe Stanfield and lost territory. It's, it's very simple for Avon. He's just a soldier. Well, I was going to say, he probably sees in Stringer that Stringer could go so much further than, than the west side of Baltimore that he could have real power and whatever. And I think he, he doesn't like that. He keeps trying to pull him back down, as you said. He keeps trying to pull him back into his place. Oh, so do you think it's jealousy that he's... I think, yeah, I think so. I mean, have you guys seen The Corner, the previous, the prequel to this sort of, or the, the previous David Simon? They made this analogy where um, people in the ghetto, anyone who tries to get out of the ghetto, it's like a like a ball of crabs. Any crab who tries to crawl out is pulled back down or something like that. It's, yeah. What I guess yeah. what shocked me is that the actual the actual physical method with which string you know string is going to get off to at this point, um, but the sheer kind of it's almost like once upon a time in Baltimore it's shot like a western and then the final shootout like he doesn't even to get he has this kind of final like just get it over with but he doesn't even get to finish the sentence he's just like moaned down it's so unsentimental and it's just it's over like it's been building and building and building and before you know it it's gone and it's it's just viciously cruel. Well, get on with it, motherfucker. And he, he finds out that he was betrayed just before he was killed. And he died 
like poetically in the sort of skeleton of this this dream building that he'd been oh, building yeah, the for all season. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's weird because thinking about it, and I'm getting quite sort of emotional about it. I mean, I wouldn't put it up there with. You know Wallace, or I mean D'Angelo. I think the most moving death, but that's just I mean, there's something so unromantic about this great, great iconic character. And that's it. You can be fell down, and it's just game over. I, I think it's so like tragic, like sweepingly tragic. I mean, a lot of the series is rooted in this really dense social realism, but then you have these moments of like almost Greek tragedy where people betray each other and 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 fail in in their dreams. Yeah. Okay, and a quick final word on uh, the politics that we see in season three. Like, do you really think Mayor Royce would have been like down? He makes a gamble, doesn't he? He makes a bit of a bet that when people see the crimes that come from Amsterdam, they'll think he made the right move. But basically, Amsterdam is game over for Mayor Royce and allows Carcetti to run. Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to believe that uh, sort of a um, a successful politician would see like a pretty huge gamble like that as being like something to to roll the dice on but uh, it wasn't even like he wasn't even like he was in that much trouble at that point in his in the run was he no i mean he would have been re-elected no problem i think that's the impression i had yeah, yeah. so he, he kind of makes this play on this i don't know it, 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 yes it's just an enormous mistake uh what did you guys think of cutty <laughs> cutty to me he's like the quentin martel it's all very well <laughs> Uh. <laughs> and, it's like, and it's a really cute story and the women all base yeah. ties but it's just like taking pages away from me seeing more Stringer and more Avon and more like Panther uh. Reformation I mean it's just such a lovely happy story and you know what else yeah, you know, I mean, like, I, I guess if someone had asked me, you know, two minutes ago what I, what I thought about Cuddy, I would have said that I really liked him. But now that you've mentioned it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be so easily led. I feel like, you know, Brianna. Well, no, I mean, yeah. to take the years. Now that you've compared him to Quentin Martel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I hated him. Well, no, no, I mean, it's just now that you say it, it is sort of, um, like I said, I do sort of feel like nothing important happens there, almost, I guess. I can see why they might have in- Introduced the character. I just don't feel that enough happened with the character yeah. throughout, throughout, almost throughout the, the re- remainder of the show. I mean, the last season he was barely in. I mean, he just dipped in and out. So I, I don't really. It might be that he was an, an introduction that just didn't didn't quite pay off. Yeah, I mean, he just seemed to never have quite done enough to. I don't know. Not I guess justify isn't quite the right word, but justify. The amount of screen time he had. Yeah, well, I, I agree. I agree. His role in season four was pretty minimal. I mean, he just he was just there while the kids were training and boxing. Um, but I thought his story in season three was kind of interesting because he immediately is drawn back into the game, but he just can't. He he just doesn't see himself that way. So obviously something's he's gone undergone this change in prison, and he just doesn't see himself as a player anymore. And yeah, he's kind of the only successful. Uh, reform story of that season, which which in which reform is the big theme. Like it's kind of the, one of the few hopeful stories I thought. Look, I mean, I don't mind Cutty. I'm just not baking him an apple pie anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he does. He is kind of off on his own. He, he doesn't necessarily intertwine. Yeah, with the he, rest he of the does, stories. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. He he just doesn't intertwine. Uh, doesn't mesh with like the larger plot uh, as much as uh, I think most side characters do. Yeah, I can understand that, yeah. I mean, actually, thinking about it now, maybe they introduced him in season three to show what a scarcity there is of, like, good, solid male role models for kids and, indeed, for these women who are mothers to kids. And, like, just a solid, upstanding citizen like that would be a hot commodity in that community. Like, (laughs) taking the piss out of the apple pies aside, that... So when we come into season four, which is all about how these kids are being raised, you've had this soft introduction through Cuddy to just yeah. the absence of good parent, especially um, paternal parenting is. Uh, I think it also illustrates how um, almost segregated these uh, people of the underclass or criminals or people who have gone to prison are from the rest of society. Like, he can't get a job. He either works as a landscaper or he goes back into the game. And the game is this economy that it's always working, it's always operating, it's always taking yeah. new workers, um, and that's just not the case for any other jobs. It's certainly uh, not you know, the docks, as we see in Season 2, but it's this economy that they've built for themselves because they've been separated from the rest of society. 
Although, if you think about it, the reason why it's always taking newcomers is because people are getting killed. And, you know, the, cut, yeah. the cutty thing is always one about, I can earn, you know, whatever it is, a few bucks being a landscaper and get zero respect from people. But you're going to earn those few bucks until you're a ripe old age. Yeah, Prop Joe is one of the few older, older members. I guess most of them die young. Yeah. Or go to prison, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll go to prison now. And then get killed in prison. Well, yeah. Mm. <laughs> Um, on to season four? Cool. So season four is all Oh, uh, sorry, real quick, one little trivia thing. I, a friend of mine was telling me this the other day, and I didn't know it. Um, did you guys know that uh, Bunny Colvin's lieutenant is an actual former police officer named Jay yeah. Lansman? <laughs> yeah, he's the guy, Jay Lansman from yeah, Homicide the was, Book. And the guy who played by the Deacon that. was a former hardcore drug dealer, reformed drug dealer. Really? I didn't know that. That's yeah. yeah. That's who Avon Barksdale is based on. Yeah. Oh wow, that's cool. He, he was a back. major. He was a major player in the seventies and the eighties. As well as Snoop being a real life Snoop, basically, which is really petrifying. Yeah. 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 When you walk through the garden, watch your back. Well, I beg you, pardon. Walk the straight and narrow track. If you walk with Jesus. So, on to season four, which is all about education. So, we have Prez Belusky, but you can call me Mr. Prez Belusky, becoming a teacher in secondary school. <laughs> oh, my goodness, it's so sad seeing these, these kids and what happens to them all. Um, we have Snoop and the bodies in the row houses. We have Bubbles really hitting bottom, Carcetti winning the primary, and just basically the fall of Michael, one of the kids, into the game. So the whole thing is about who parents are, what they do to you. I mean, basically, in this world, it feels like either parents are absent, or if they're present, like Naaman's mum, they're putting their kids onto the game. So you're kind of damned if you have them and damned if you don't. It's utterly, utterly tragic, but it's... It's really the apex of the Prez story. I mean, it's not, it's by no means a perfect analogy, but to me, Prez is like the Jamie Lannister of this series, insofar as he starts off as a bit of a, not a joke, but just someone he think of as having no moral heft to him whatsoever. And by season four, he's just the hero. Yeah, they do that with a few characters. I think Bodhi's another one who you sort of hate at the beginning, but by the end, you really sympathise with him. I have to say, like, the funniest line of the previous season, season three, is that Bodhi basically gets um, off the rap for Amsterdam because he's been entrapped. Like, Amsterdam is itself an entrapment. And he's like, <laughs> this must be one of those contrapment things. That's, yeah. my, that's one of my favourite yeah. lines. lines. <laughs> As a guy who needed some schooling and evidently didn't get it. But, yeah, the kids, let's talk about them in terms. So you've got um, Naaman, who's... Basically, his mum, who is it's Weebay's wife, right? So yeah, his, yeah. his dad's in prison. His mum decides that in order to continue the lavish lifestyle that her gangster husband afforded her, she's going to put her kid on the street. I mean, that's just terrific, isn't it? I mean, name is a little shit, but that's horrific. It's just sort of, you know, like what, uh, I mean, it's the only way to have a job. I mean, it's the job that her husband had, you know, like from her perspective, I, I can sort of see it in a sort of like a... Um, the way, like, the Spartans would expect their child to go and be a soldier or something like that, you know? Yeah, and she seems like one of those women who needs a man, I guess, in her life to provide. That That's true, uh, for sure. But, I mean, also it's just sort of that there there is there aren't other jobs, right? I mean, like, you're there aren't other successful jobs at any rate. I mean, you're, you're either, um, you know, a real player on the corners or you're, you know, nothing. From that but you should be nothing. I mean, the, the whole point about being an eighth grade is you should be nothing. You shouldn't mm. be things have a job. You should just be a, a, a kid playing around, doing nothing. That's your privilege and right as a kid. And it I mean, doesn't I have, exist, right? It doesn't exist. Yeah, exactly. I mean, obviously, I absolutely agree with you. But I'm just, you know, from her perspective, I mean, kids are out on the corners, you know, learning the trade, right? I mean, it's, going to school is essentially irrelevant. I mean... Being on the corners is, 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 you know, on the job training for, you know, the only job that there is. And so wasting time in school is just wasting time. Yeah. And um, she's sort of pushed into it because 
she gets her funding cut off from the Barksdales because they're not they're not making money anymore. So she probably wouldn't have done it right then. But because they had no money, she felt the need to push them out, I guess. But the money's not for food, right? The money no. is for, like, mm. clothes. <laughs> it's for bling. I mean, it's yeah. not like she's on the poverty line. Yeah, That's but true. she's I guess she's so accustomed to that lifestyle, she just feels she deserves it. Yeah, the sense of entitlement is just dangerous and scary. Yeah. yeah. And then on the other hand, like, you've got Naaman, who's basically quite kind of spoiled, and then you have this poor kid, Dookie, who, oh, man, when Presbo gives her a little wash bag, I just broke my heart. Yeah. Getting bullied because he's the smelly kid. Um, and Michael, he has some real backbone. Yeah, he, yeah, he's sort of, he's so natural to the game in the way that Naaman isn't. I mean, Naaman just sort of sits on the on the steps and plays. Um, and, and as soon as Michael gets to the, the corner where Bodie is, he just immediately begins to strategize and, and, and check out the, the, the trade. Yeah, to the point where Naaman doesn't even have, like, the sense to cut off his pretty ponytail, as his dad calls it, and, which would be so recognizable to the cop. Did any of you feel, because like, obviously, you know, Bunny rescues one of the kids, did any of you feel a bit, not sad that it was Naaman, but that he was the least deserving of being rescued. Definitely, yeah. Because, and that just got me, it was kind of like, I know The Wire is not about, you know, good people getting good rewards, but, oh. It's not entirely Naaman's fault, he's kind of pushed into this, and he obviously doesn't want to be this, but at the same time, he's so cruel to Juki, you just think he's the least deserving person of this saviour. It should have been Randy, or Juki, or, yeah, that's, that's just the way it is, yeah. Well, I'm trying to think what the random yeah. storyline was. I can't remember, really. He just ends up abused in a boy's home, right? Yeah, his mother gets... Um, well, he, he rats to the police and he, his mother gets burned. His uh, father tries to adopt him, but, but he gets sent into foster homes and just destroyed. I mean, the next time we see him, he's in season five and he's just completely changed. Oh, of course, yeah. So this is the season where Carve really becomes a stand-up guy, right? Yeah. Yeah, Carve's another one because in season one he reveals he reveals himself to be a rat and very career-minded, but he eventually evolves into someone really honourable. Yeah, he truly benefits from Freeman's influence. Or I love the way that Herc starts off as this kind of almost comedically idiotic Fuzzy Dunlop guy. <laughs> but then as the series progress, it's like it becomes like Song of Ice and Fire where everything has consequences. So he becomes a guy who through his lack of any kind of backbone, does stuff that has really nasty consequences when he's working as a private security guy. He ends up, like, really messing people's lives up. So I love how both of them, their, their story arcs get more profound as the seasons go on. I think I think that's just his, that's just his character, isn't it? Her, her character, you just understand that he doesn't really realise the consequences of, of anything. Yeah, I don't think he's necessarily malicious. He's just like a bull in a china shop. He's just reckless and he just causes bad things to happen to other people without meaning to but because of stupidity so I guess he's somewhat to blame. I don't hate Herc or anything but I mean I think he is more than somewhat to blame just it's not that he's you know too stupid to realize it I mean he doesn't he doesn't make any attempt try and understand like uh, consequences that his actions might have he just you know he does what he does and doesn't really care. I guess he doesn't learn from his mistakes. Yeah. No no. But, you know, Herc isn't an idiot, right? So, you know, when, yeah, he, exactly. he's, when he sees Royce him. getting the blowjob, he goes to Valchek and gets the... I mean, he uses that leverage really cleverly. Mm-hmm. So he has a kind of a low cunning, if not a high intelligence. He's, 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 he's not a total hump. No. Although he does a very good impression of being a total hump at times. Yeah. <laughs> but he's not like... He's not a Sant'Angelo. Right. No. Yeah, exactly. Or a Polk. He's not a Polk. The first time you saw Snoop, did you think it was a guy? Probably. I don't yeah. I, I don't remember. I can't remember. Yeah, yeah probably. Probably. The first time I saw Snoop, I couldn't understand what she was saying. Yeah. <laughs> like, I can understand the Baltimore accent. accent's fine, but I literally had to put subtitles on. I can't remember. Is, is, is she introduced in the first scene of the season? Is the first, isn't the first scene her buying no, the nails? No, you see her in season three. You do? Okay, season that's what I thought. Three, yeah. But, but she, has, she has the first... Season, she has the first scene of season four, I think, where she's buying the nail gun. The nail gun, yeah. You good? Yeah, man. Man said if you want to shoot nails, this is the Cadillac, man. He made Lexus, but he ain't know it. Oh, the charge better? Man, fuck a charge. This is a gun powder activated, 27 caliber, full auto, no kickback, nail thorn mayhem, man. Shit right here is tight. <laughs> Fuck this nail up, boys. We can kill a couple motherfuckers with this right here. <laughs> you laughing? I'm a school dog. Try to talk. For real. 
that was like, a great yeah. <laughs> she's so like out of I mean she's so not in normal society that she like tips the guy in, in Home Depot yeah he's like what <laughs> <laughs> but she's like talking about it like a real pro like yeah this one won't jam up and you know have recoil and stuff yeah and I guess you th- I guess maybe you think initially that the nail gun's going to be used for I don't know to kill somebody maybe but in yeah the end it's, it's, it's used for like an even worse thing yeah, it's actually yeah. been used as a nail gun, but for the first. Yeah, time. yeah, it's kind of. I guess when you look back at it, it's it's even more horrible than it initially seems. Yeah, the, those murders in the vacants are really disturbing, especially the way Chris kind of sooth, soothingly talks to each of his victims, and then they kill them and they throw lie on them, and yeah, it's really cold. Yeah, Chris isn't exactly the the nicest guy in the world, is he? And yeah, but he's yeah. not Marlowe, is he? I mean, there's a certain. Yeah. Just, he's not a bad guy. I mean, like I know that he and he corrupt Michael. <laughs> but there's a kind of. There's I think Chris is a bad guy. Right? <laughs> I mean, I, I kind of. Yeah. Murderer, but... <laughs> okay, why is Chris a bad guy? Uh, well, um, okay. He, he kills just, people. He's, he's an unrelenting murder machine. <laughs> but he's not. He's not Robo murder machine. He's not Marley, right? And... Oh, he's almost. He's not far off. Okay. He's a Robo murder machine. <laughs> Maybe I should go back and watch these. Exactly season. what he is. <laughs> okay. I need to go back and watch season four. I don't know, like I don't, I don't find the um, the talking to people, like I don't find that creepy or cold or anything. I I feel like he's trying to be nice, right? Like I mean, like this is his yeah, job. He kills yeah. people, and he's sort of he's made his peace with that to some extent, right? That he does a, a bad thing, and that's his job. But like he's not interested. He's not a sadist at all, right? He's not. He's neither a sadist nor a psychopath. He's not interested in in these people being sad or scared or hurt. And he doesn't not care that they're sad and scared and hurt, um, but he has to kill them because that's his job. And you know, to the extent that he can give them any comfort, that's what he wants to do. So is he almost is he almost like um, Weebay in a way? Yeah. Is he, is he no. that kind I mean, of killing machine and I don't know. Weebay doesn't. Like, oh, like I, guess, I guess it kind of is. Yeah. I think yeah, I mean, like to jump ahead really far. Um, at the end of season five, I mean, there's a, a pretty clear parallel drawn between. Uh, Chris and Weebay, right? They meet well, in the prison yard or whatever. They're, they're both depicted as soldiers, so I guess you're kind of right in a way, Bina, that they're not necessarily cruel. They're just doing what they're told to. And the, the, right. the victims are all in the, all in the game, apart from uh, obviously that poor security lady, I guess, didn't really deserve to die. You know, and, my point yeah. is, why do we think that Chris is like a bad guy, but we like Omar? Because they both just kill people who are in the game, and that's just their job. You know, Chris is just a hired assassin, and Omar just robs drug dealers. And I mean, Chris yeah. doesn't. They Chris don't doesn't try and kill innocent people for the fun of it. They don't get right. any joy out of it. That's just what they do. And if Chris can have a little light conversation as he's going along to kill you, then that's what he's going to do. I realise yeah. that saying it is complete nonsense, but I just think there's a bit of a double standard, probably for me, in how I treat Chris and Omar. I think a lot of. People but- but Omar's not an assassin. He robs people, and if they try to kill him, he'll kill them back. But he's not necessarily going yeah, to Yeah, but he's, he's chosen to rob people who don't want to be robbed. So, I mean, I think he's chosen to throw away. <laughs> Nobody wants to be robbed. There's, there's, a pretty high in, there's a pretty high likelihood that peeps are going to die. Although there is that one brilliant, is it in season two, where he goes to rob, um, rob some drugs, and because, rob some drug money, and because they see him coming, and they know what, they just drop him the goods. Check it out. Here it comes. Something ain't right, yo. Watch out, man. Look on that fool. It's packing. Here he comes. Yo. Yo, so come on. Yo, Omar coming, man. Mm, like, he doesn't yeah. forget his gun. His reputation is enough. <laughs> and season four, he's just going to get cereal, and he just leans yes. against the wall, and a thing of drugs drops down next to him. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> he's like... That's like, great. He's like a central banker, just... He can talk down the markets. He doesn't need to have his gun. <laughs> yeah, his reputation is so fierce at that point. Yeah, he's like the the Ben Bernanke of uh, drug dealing robbers. Um, yeah, I guess my question would be: um, Would Omar have killed Michael's stepdad? Hmm. I don't I think, think he would have done. Mm-hmm. Especially not not done. in the way that Chris did. No, I agree. I agree. I, Again, though, he, he doesn't really work for anyone. He just works for himself, so he wouldn't really take an order like that, I don't think. He has the luxury of not having to do it. He's a free agent, yeah. But maybe that's 
maybe the reason why he does work for himself is for that very reason. Like the fact that he has an ethical code means that back in the day when he made that decision, he didn't want to put himself in that position. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I it, guess it's not bullshit with Although, him, right? He does believe that stuff about not killing innocent people, and yeah, you know when he gets believe. angry about yeah. his grandma getting shot at on a Sunday, yeah. whatever it was. I mean, he cares. Yeah, he believes that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, although going back slightly, um, as far as the wasn't there? Uh, maybe I'm misremembering. Isn't there something implied about um, like Chris really hates Michael's dad, right, or stepdad, or whatever? Does like, it? I, yeah, I think. Like I think it's implied that Chris was abused as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, That's, that was the impression I had as well. Because he says you can you, you can look him in the eye at the end. Yeah. Yeah. So it's an honor killing. Yeah, in a way. That's kind of why I kind of like Chris because he he does look after Michael in a sense, and I like Michael, so yeah. Yes, yeah, so that was my theory about why Chris wasn't quite Robo Killer because in this kind of messed up way in which he does corrupt Michael, but he does look out for him too. Uh, uh, from from Chris's perspective, I don't think that, you know, like, he wouldn't see it as corrupting Michael, right? He would see it as bringing along someone who was into, into his business, into a higher uh, position in his business, which is the only business at which you can make any money at all. I also think he acts as a father figure. I think one of the th- things you see in season four is all of these kids lack any responsible maternal or paternal figure. I mean, Dookie's yeah. parents are gone. Uh, Randy, Randy has a nice uh, foster mum, but she dies. Michael's mother is obviously horrible and lets this pedophile back into their lives. Naaman's yeah. mum is horrible. And Sherrod as well. And I think you see a, a lot of um, a lot of these older characters stepping up as father figures. Obviously, Bubbles tries to be a father figure to Sherrod, and Chris tries to be a father figure to um, Michael Colvin, obviously, with Naaman. Yeah. And Carver with, yeah. uh, with uh, Randy. Again, if you want to talk heartbreaking scenes, in season five when Dookie comes up to Presbo and asks him for some cash. And... Yeah. Oh, oh man. So in a, oh, it breaks your heart yet again. When he's walking at the end. Yeah, and you know full like... well what's happening. So yeah. from that point of view, I think Chris is right. Chris sees that basically, if you're a kid of the, these guys' age, you can end up name on like being a hopper. But you can think that Chris is saying, "Look, this guy's got some natural talent for killing, and I'm going to bring him into my job and make him my apprentice." And he's right. at least going to be near the top of the. He's not going to be a king, but he's going to be a rook or something in this yeah, exactly. stupid game. And he's going to instead of living to 17, he might live to 27, and then do some time. But it's a better option. In his own yeah. messed up way, I think Chris is okay. It's just that he did kill that security guard and that lady, which is pretty cold. I don't think... Yeah, I, like, he's not... If if you wanted to use, like, the term, if you wanted to say, like, someone was... Like, Omar was okay because he only killed people who were, you know, in the game or whatever. I mean, Chris definitely kills people out of the game. I mean, like, he's... But not but, on a uh, humbug. Yeah, exactly. Like, he's... he. I think that he is a... If we can't say he's a good person, I think we can say that he's, like at least a nice person with, like, some human instincts. He tries. Exactly, yeah. He's a killer with some humanity, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah he has some humanity. So he's like uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger in Terminator 2. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. He knows why they cry. Anything else in season four? I'm trying to think what else is happening. Uh, Bodhi. Oh, uh, Bodhi, yeah. Bodhi and his... It's, it's, I think it's Bodhi and McNulty... When they're in whatever the park, when they when they get the sandwiches or whatever, and and Bodhi, it's yeah. it's, it's just it's horrible because Bodhi says he gets to the point where he says I feel old, and you're like oh god, you're like twenty something, twenty one, twenty two, yeah. and it's <laughs> like no, 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 it's it, it, it says it says everything about him in that moment. I've been out there since I was thirteen. I ain't never fucked up a count, never stole off a package, never did some shit that I wasn't told to do. I've been straight up. But what come back? Hmm? You think if I get jammed up on some shit, they'd be like, all right, yeah, Vody been there. Vody hang tough. We got his pay lawyer. We got a bell. They want me to stand with him, right? So where the fuck are they at when they supposed to be standing by us? I mean, when shit goes bad and it's hell to pay, where they at? I do what I got to I don't give a fuck. Just don't ask me to live on my fucking knees, you know? You're a soldier, Vody. And it's a complete um, parallel with uh, Wallace, who also did a similar thing. He couldn't, he couldn't, he was fed up with his life and he talked to the police and he was killed by his friends for it. Mm-hmm. I love that scene at the end where Bodhi dies though, because he's so frustrated and he's fed up and he screams, you're not going to board me up in one of those houses. So he's just completely rebelled against the system. Yeah. Which I think was a death worthy of a soldier like Bodhi, yeah. 
Yeah, he deserved he deserved that kind of end to his storyline. Yeah, I think he got mm. yeah, Bodhi got the the death that uh, he was due, sort of. Mm. And it's it's funny because he's always this character that he's never really a main character, but he's always there. And by season four, you really feel like you know him. I just kind of wish that for him. What was the name of his sidekick who ends up working in Foot Locker? Poot. 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 Uh, Poot, yeah. I just, I kind of always had this vision that maybe, maybe, even though David Simon's not a sentimental guy, he might let Bodie work you know, for Locker. Slip burgers or something. Yeah. At White yeah, but it's almost like he, he'd probably rather die as a soldier in a firefight than, than work at McDonald's for the rest of his life. Yeah. I feel maybe a little bit of that D'Angelo introspection rubbed off onto Bodie. Like, he really understood where he was in that game. I think Bodhi had dedicated himself to this game, and he was into it. It's just that the rules that he'd have spent his life obeying, they weren't giving anything back. Like, he, the promise that he was given wasn't repaid, whereas the angel, I, I think, just wanted out. I wonder if maybe if Avon Barksdale had remained on top and Marlowe hadn't come up. Right, if, if he would have been able to... Definitely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the system changed around him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah the powers that be uh, screwed him. And yeah, we haven't really spoken much about Carcassi. Avon. You sort of hate him the second rewatch, I think. He's Little sort of, singer. You invest so much hope in him. You know, our big Song of Ice and Fire actor, Game of Thrones. Yeah. Actor. Yeah. I don't know. I, I didn't really... Um, I quite. I really love politics, actually, and political machinations, but again, it was just a storyline that maybe didn't... It just took me away from where I kind of wanted to be. I mean, it was good mm. to get the kind of the spotlight on how it all works and... Royce and a little bit more of Clay Davis, but you didn't like the election storyline. It's not that I didn't like it; it's just it's kind of a relative thing. So it's mm. how I feel about Dawn. It's not necessarily the place I'd want to be, you know, given that I only have thirteen episodes or whatever. Actually, I heard they were, they actually envisioned a second series, like just focusing on the politics called the yes. Hall. So that might account for some of the uh, the divide between the storylines. Ah, oh, okay. So there was going to be a spin-off. I think yeah, but obviously called? they couldn't get it because they couldn't get the ratings for the wire, and they're not going to get a second show out of it. I think it was called the Hall. I think. Yeah, the Hall. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of wonder a little bit about the um, the casting of Aidan Gillen as well, whether he was convincing as a charismatic politician. He maybe not square jawed enough, really. Okay. I would think of him as very perfect for middle finger because he has a slightly. Um, Sleazy quality. He's very much. He just comes across as a backroom operator rather than a front man, especially in US mm. politics, where it's much more about sort of the look and you know. Um, but you know, it's it's local politics, I guess, which probably makes a difference. Yeah, yeah. Local guys always look slimy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Do you think there's something to be said for the fact that this show never won the Emmys that probably deserved because it was just too, like, one of the accusations is it was just too black for America to watch it? Like, it has McNulty as this kind of, um, the sort of the lead actor white guy that we can identify with, but it's just too, it was just too intense to look at a world that not many people were that familiar with. There's probably political aspects, like, you know, a lot of these aren't part of, all of these actors aren't part of the acting guild, so they wouldn't get as many votes or it's it's not a union it, the Baltimore isn't a town that brings in a lot of money or something like that so the one um, show that I, really talks about union doesn't get the union vote <laughs> I, I don't know exactly what it is but it, it um, but I almost like the fact that it didn't win any Emmys it's kind of like a it's like an underground thing but it's weird right because you know there are other difficult shows like Mad Men and Breaking Bad don't have massive viewership but they do win critical acclaim and yeah, I, love, but I love those shows, but The Wire is better. I but really Batman like. presents itself as such a, a like a prestige kind of thing, and it is a really well written thing. But The Wire is so much more challenging. I think it doesn't make itself easy to watch. You know, you really have to pay attention and get into it, as you know, as opposed to some of the shows like The Sopranos or Mad Men. I just wonder if 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 The Wire had been on or released at the time of Netflix and. The interweb, <laughs> it, would it have had more viewers? Yeah, it's also one of those shows that you can't really watch like a single episode of it. You need to watch the whole thing, and I, I can't even imagine watching it week to week. Like I watched the whole thing on DVD. That's like I, I, I wouldn't be able to keep up if it was week to week. You got to watch it all in this big chunk, like a, like reading a novel or something. Yeah. Yeah. They say that they, they, you have to. If somebody's starting to watch it for the first time, they have to watch like three or four to start with, or else. They, they can't make up their mind after one or two. It's, it's impossible to, 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 for them to know if they're going to be hooked or not by one. I was just going to say, when you start watching it, it's so impenetrable. The language and the 
accents and all those things, you really have to get into it and learn about this world um, in order to follow the storyline, which is ultimately really satisfying and rewarding, but it doesn't make itself um, you know, amenable to first-time viewers or casual viewing. And yet, I kind of thought the same would happen with um, Game of Thrones. I was quite blown away by its success because, again, it has this massive cast of characters, all these houses. And he was just wondering, like, how is the casual viewer going to figure out what's going on and who the hell Danny is? And I think Game of Thrones has, I mean, for me, I was, I'd not read the books before the show. And so coming, coming to the show, I was, I was, I was a complete casual viewer. And I watched the, fir- I watched the pilot and, Literally, the the end scene of the pilot completely hooked me, and I wanted to know what happened next. Which is what um, was that? Is that when um, is that the pushing out the window scene? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that is that is the complete cliffhanger of the pilot, and I mean the wire doesn't have that. The wire has nothing in the pilot. The pilot introduces yeah. a whole ton of characters and doesn't really tell you very much about any of them, apart from maybe McNulty and. Kima or somebody like that, but it doesn't have it doesn't have a hook to bring a load of people back the next week, which I think Game of Thrones had. I think also um, the characters in Game of Thrones are a lot more coded. I mean, they have like looks, and you know, the Lannisters are all golden, and the Starks are all, you know, they, they have a look about them. And Danny's obviously very distinguishable, um, and they use all these symbols like the, the sigils of the houses to distinguish them, and you sort of group people in these houses. Um, and I think by the third episode, you've sort of figured out that it's Starks versus Lannisters, whereas Baltimore or, or The Wire is so much more complicated. And it's just all of these actors, all of these African-American actors, and you don't know who, where their allegiances lie or who's with who, and it's it's a lot more complicated, I think, because it's not fantastical, it's, it's real life. I was just thinking, like, the orange sofa as the Iron Throne. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, is there anything more on season four, boys and girls? Uh, that that scene, at, I think it's at the end of episode, of the second last episode, where Randy is calling after Carver. That's one of my most memorable scenes, and it really devastates me. Oh. The, where he's um, saying, oh, you know, you're going to look out for me and all that. Um, yeah. Also, there's the Bubbles storyline, Bubbles' downfall. I don't know if we touched on that. That was really sad. I think that's why the, this is the bleakest season for me. It's so dark, because Bubbles is always that kind of, glint of hope but he, he he has such a tough time in this season yeah and because Defense. mcnulty's not in it so much you don't have the kind of bunk mcnulty humor you don't have a lot of the right the because goofier getting drunk kind of humor right more than any other season like all sort of all the main characters being you know the kids this year and a lot of them end up you know in really bad places yeah, it's so, dark. Okay. I think the dark irony of McNulty is whenever you see him, he's got this big grin on his face. But he's the reason he's so happy is because he's given up. He's given up trying to buck the system. He's just accepted things are going to be crappy, and that's it. Yeah, but, I mean, at the same time, I mean, I, I think in season four, he's sort of, uh, you know, kind of like Cuddy. Uh, he's doing a small job, right, and not trying to do anything big. But I mean, it's 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 not like he's just like you know, sort of like oh, I don't care about anything anymore. I'll just do this and it'll be fine. I mean, no, no, it's, yeah. I, I think it's more that he's accepted and and he doesn't, as Bunk says, he he stops giving a fuck when he's he's not meant to. <laughs> yeah. Giving a fuck when it ain't your turn to give a fuck. Oh, I love that phrase. But I, I mean, I yeah, that, I bust that quote. But you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um. Yeah, but I mean, you can also look at it as just like sort of like you know changing his priorities because I mean he's happily with uh, what's her name right during all of season four. BD. BD. Yeah. So I mean, like he has like a home life, a domestic life, and he's uh, you know I think doing generally good uh, you know beat cop mm-hmm. work or whatever. He's just yeah. he's not. He's not striving for anything big. But I think it makes sense that Bodhi's death in some way would contribute to McNulty being back on the booze. Yeah. And in general, I just think it was never going to last. There would always be something because he's just basically an alcoholic, right? I mean.
Yeah. Yep. Yep. So season five, McNulty is back. McNulty becomes McNutty. He creates the fake serial killer, which is just hilarious. Um, in order to basically get the resources to police properly the bodies in the row houses. But meanwhile, you've got Lester Freeman um, properly onto Chris and Snoop, just through old-fashioned police work. And it's really interesting because with the by having McNulty go so far, you really see that Kima and Bunk have lines that they really won't cross, that there are some cops who aren't corruptible. You also have the attempted prosecution of Senator Clay Davis which is just hilarious. You have Carchetti in power, and then we have the decline of the press. All right, people, it's 2 o'clock. I need budget lines in case anybody's threatening to commit an act of daily journalism. Widely regarded as the weakest of the seasons, the shortest of the seasons, certainly. A desperate rush to fit, tie everything up. And yet, I think, in its own way, quite powerful because of the reformation of bubbles. We have bubbles cleaning himself up, living in his sister's basement and selling copies of the Baltimore Sun so it all ties up. But yeah, the fake serial killer. <laughs> Jesus, what the fuck did I do? You happy now, bitch? I've made my peace with it, though. I think it's within the realms of the series, it, it becomes plausible. Yeah, I think it's kind of depicted as, yeah, it's this, I kind of believe it within the context of the season, uh, within the season. Um, like when I first saw it, I didn't think it was crazily outlandish as some people. But I think for me, the problem is that kind of changes McNulty. I mean, he just becomes too crazy from what we've seen before. I mean, I, I realize he's really frustrated. Um, and you can see the doubts that he, that he harbors, but it just seems like he's gone too far off the deep end. It, it, seems to betray his character a bit. Yeah, I think it does spin out of control very quickly, which I think is the problem. It starts out being this small thing, and then it turns very quickly into when he brings the homeless guy in. It, it, it escalates too quickly in my mind. But I guess, again, that's the problem with the, the ten episode arc. It has to escalate probably quicker than it, than it should do. Because yeah. actually, The Wire has always been a se- series where each season, the first half goes really slowly. And then yeah. about two-thirds of the way through, something usually happens that's quite big, like the chemo shooting or whatever it is. And then it just goes into, like, incredible, everything coalesces, everything comes together, and it's super exciting. But this one was just on, like, it was on speed the whole way through. The small number of episodes plus trying to wrap everything up. You know, for everybody, and mm. yeah, but then also introduce the the newspaper storyline, which I don't yeah, think exactly. ever had the room to breathe that it needed to. It, it, yeah, it, I, it I, makes me kind of feel ambivalent towards those those characters because I don't feel that I either love or hate them. Like they're just kind of just kind of there, but there in the background. Which is a shame, right? Because Gus is a potentially cool character, but totally forgettable in the context yeah. of a very rushed season. Yeah, I, I would have rather they just completely focused on the press and, and done away with this serial killer storyline and the homeless storyline. It just it just um, cannibalised too much of the season. But yeah, I think, I mean, David Simon is, is coming from the media. I thought it would, that would have been his um, bread and butter. He could have fleshed out a really interesting examination of the press, but it wasn't the case. I, I also think my problem with it is in the previous seasons, they analysed the sort of systemic problems of institutions and their dysfunction, whereas the problem with the press seemed to be just this one guy who was making up stories. And obviously the bosses kind of encouraged it, and there was layoffs and things like that, but the main thrust of the problem with that season was just this one guy who was making up stories, which again seemed a bit uh, simplistic and outlandish for a show that more interested in sociological systemic problems. Yeah, I mean, I guess they were kind of trying to show that that, that that one guy making things up wouldn't have been a problem if there was, you know, like a, a proper organization with proper oversight or whatever. But you're right, it did sort of, it sort of focused on him too hard. Like there, if there had been multiple smaller issues that they could have tied into, like, a systemic, uh, you know, lack of oversight or, or too few reporters or whatever, I, it probably would have been better. But it, it might have been cool to see some reporters investigating stories and trying to tell a particular story from that and having that story, I don't know, try, shaped by, uh, to, to a simplistic narrative by the, the bosses. Maybe that would have been more 
showing yeah. the problems of the newspaper and how they're trying, always trying to dumb things down to the average reader. There's a theory that the implausibility of the serial killer story is kind of deliberate and sarcastic on the point of view of David Simon, who, after all, is getting his show cancelled because it's not getting the ratings at a <laughs> time when things like CSI and Law and Order are absolutely creaming the ratings. And that he's not just making a point with the newspapers that if it bleeds, it leads. And this is how kind of vacuous newspapers are, that the big flashy story, even though the editor knows it's probably half not true, will go with. That he's mm. also making a point about, ha ha, this is the kind of outlandish stuff you have to put in a TV show to win. And look how ridiculous mm. it is when you put it in the context of a show that's doing something that's Shakespeare and you just throw in a stupid sort of tabloid serial killer story. So if you want to really give David Simon the benefits of the doubt, that's that's the kind of line you go with. Uh, and I love how he puts the, the word Dickensian aspect into all the most loathsome characters, because that's how many of the critics characterise The Wire. Mm. But I mean, other than the serial killer, there are amazing, amazing moments in this. I mean, the death of Omar, or the, the, yeah. the, the, the spiralling I loved his down. Whole the spiraling down of Omar, it's just tragic. And then that some like stupid kid would get him. The yeah. fearful Omar who the could corn. rob a drug dealer without even pulling his gun. How yeah. are the mighty fallen? Yeah, uh, there's some great action moments with Omar this uh, in the fifth season, especially when it blows yeah. up that car. And he's just raging against Marlo and calling him out. And it was really kind of satisfying to hear Marlo brought down, brought low like that. What what do we think of his murder? Just I mean, he he never thought he'd be killed by a kid or. Like he, had, he always had his guard up around drug dealers, but I don't know. I sort of feel like it's just, it's one of those things that, um, like, the, like I'm sure he's had you know like a thousand different you know it's, it's it was a complete you know crazy little coincidence sort of a thing that happened, and I'm sure that there's been you know a thousand times where something like that almost happened to Omar and didn't or whatever. I mean, it's just like if you do the kind of job that Omar does. Like, eventually someone's going to kill you. Eventually you're going to roll the dice and it's going to come up, you know, oh, snake eyes or whatever. Do you think McNulty gets away too lightly? I don't know. I mean, considering the, the degree to which, you know, the police department and the uh, the mayor's office and stuff has been shown in previous seasons to to want to cover up anything bad... I can almost buy it. Yeah, I guess he's been yeah. screwed over. He's been screwed over so many times that this one he kind of gets away with. I guess. Uh, I, I guess it's. I don't know. I just. I was going <laughs> to say. I like how the um, the bosses are finally compromised um, by their own lie for the first time. That that they become compromised by um, McNulty, and he sort of has as much on them as they have on him. So they yeah. can't really bring him down. It's like mutually assured destruction. And I guess, I guess one thing that I, the sort of way I would wrap it, I don't think that McNulty getting off as lightly as he did is any more ridiculous than the serial killer plot in general. And so to that extent, I don't have a problem with it. And do you think that Kima, do you blame Kima for snitching? It just felt like it needed to happen. So they just made Kima do it. Like it just, it was, it needed to happen for the story. I don't yeah, think they it, needed to wrap it up. And it so. felt within her character, yeah. Yeah, I just felt that by that point she had so much loyalty to that group that I could definitely see her not going along with it, but it felt sure, too much. Yeah. It felt too much for Kima to snitch on them. Maybe not on McNussy at that point, but on Lester. She yeah. has real respect for Lester as real police. and. Um... I guess you could see it as her actively not becoming like McNulty. I mean, she could. you see in season three her slowly becoming more and more like him but that's her decision not to be like him and not to go down that path mm. yeah i mean i guess i guess in previous seasons you see characters who snitch for a reason whether it's to, to further their careers or something but i'm not I, I think you're right i don't think Kim is doing it for that reason i think he's doing it to be the good the good guy really and to, to separate herself from mcnulty and freeman i just feel that the way it all shook out at the end i felt mcnulty got away easy I mean, even Beattie takes him back at the end. Yeah. Everything was wrapped up a bit neatly, I think. You know, this is not a sentimental show, and yet he gets the really sentimental happy end. Right, yeah. He gets the mock eulogy from Jay, and off he goes. Right. Vomiting into the moonlight, basically. (laughs) (laughs) I guess he's safe purely because he's not a cop anymore. Maybe that was his tragic flaw, and that's the, the thing he was best at, but... Once he stops being it, he maybe find some peace. 
Yeah, what do we think that he would have become? Yeah, I was just trying to think that too. I don't, <laughs> I don't have any idea what he would do. No. Like, and again, like I don't. I mean, I, I have a hard time believing that any kind of peace that he would find is 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 uh, going to last. But I don't know. Maybe he's the. Um... Isn't he the Ed Burns or one of the writers sort of stand in? Maybe he'll write a, a series about, the life <laughs> about him, his experiences. Become an author, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like Nolte, the poet, the winner. Well, he shows he has the imagination, right? So yeah, that's true. The Thomas Harris, the Baltimore. I'm trying to imagine some kind of Aaron Sorkin behind the scenes show about writing of like, Nolte's crime drama. <laughs> 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 Anything more on uh, season five? Um, can we can we give it up for um, for Slim Charles? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Joe. yeah, that was cool. Slim Charles to me is kind of like the Jay Landsman. He's like this kind of yeah, like ridiculously efficient, actually quite competent guy who has within a corrupt institution some actual ethics in a way. Well, I think it shows that the drug trade is being pulled between these two forces. And, you know, you've got Marlo and Avon in season three and then Cheese and uh, Slim Charles in season five. And he just he just he's sick of it and he pulls it back to where, you know, where he wants to, where he thinks it's it's better than it, than it would sort of the, the lesser of two evils. How are people doing on time? Have you got time for a bit of an after show on? Yeah, I'm still OK. Yeah, okay, yeah I'm, I'm OK. So my question was, because it's like one of those stupid, like if you had a superhero power, what it, would it be? Who's the biggest badass in the series? series and contenders not exclusively brother muzone prop joe omar snoop the greek clay davis chris weebe any others you might want to add and um, i'm just going omar all the way obviously yeah i think that's yeah that's, that's hard to like, argue omar wandering through just like whist- whistling the farmer in the dell yeah yeah <laughs> doing a drug robbery and saying don't make me huff and puff now <laughs> you need to open his door man for huff and puff more now about the hands of your chinny chin chin. Omar, you best scroll out. We up in here with the Mac tank. Oh, I think it's not, Terrell. I think it's not. Y'all might need to think this through and stop wasting my time. Because Omar will come back tomorrow. And the next day. And the next day. And I will put a bullet in all y'all behind what happened right now. <laughs> the way he's he great. <laughs> strolls into a court and owns Levy. Yeah, um, so great. Like he, whether it's on the kind of like the institutional side, like the law side or the drug corner side, he just owns it until season five when he doesn't. But you know that guy is badass. So I yeah, love him. Yeah, like, he's he's, yeah. he's straight out of a western or something. He's great. Yeah. yeah. Any anyone going to propose anyone else, or are we all just agree <laughs> on so much? I suppose you can make a case for Clay Davis because. Yeah. Well, he yeah he gets away. I suppose. He has the most absolute power. And, like, yeah. he makes Stringer Bell... He makes a lot of the other badasses look stupid, like Stringer Bell. I think um, Lester pulls some pretty cool moves. And yeah. he ends up with, like, the totally hot young chick. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> mm, cool <laughs> Lester's eye move. surgery he's had done on the, on, on the Baltimore Police Department. <laughs> yeah, he looks like a hump, but he isn't a hump. Yeah. And special mention to Slim Charles for killing. Jeez. <laughs> Yeah, sorry. Yes, we the honorary Slim Charles Big Badass Award. <laughs> um, the biggest idiot in the series. So nominees for this award are Nikki Sabotka, Ziggy Sabotka, Huck, um, Naimond, McNutty. I don't know if you want to put anyone else on there. Uh, I vote Ziggy. Yeah, I'm tempted to say Ziggy as well. Uh, that reporter who was doing the serial killer story, though, was... Really fucking stupid, in my opinion. But he's like sociopathic, that guy. Yeah, but I mean, also just like I mean, yeah, I mean, what was his name? Was it Tremont or something? Uh, Scott Templeton. 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 That's it. Yeah. But I, I but, feel that we only got to, we didn't get to like his character was very one dimensional, and I don't true. feel like we got to know yeah. him. Like that's my problem with all the journalists. We didn't get to know them outside the office really so we didn't get to all the other characters we got to know them completely and I, I don't feel we got to know him so yeah he might be an idiot because of what he did but I just feel like um, you can like I can see doing like you know a story or 
something like that. If you're having a hard time, like, you make up something like that. But, like, suddenly deciding, like, no, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to make up shit for all of my fucking stories. And just, like, I'm sure it'll be fine and I'll never get cut. I mean, you've got that guy, I can't remember his name from the... Oh, Jason Blair? Yeah, There's been a couple, right? Right, yeah, there's been a couple. Um, And so, I mean, obviously it is something that people do, but at the same time, it's just incredibly stupid. Yeah. Yeah, it's so crazy, yeah. But I think for, like, pure numbskullery, I'm just, I mean, I'm always brought back to that Herc and Carl trying to get that death through the door on episode one of season one. And Herc yeah. will always be my favourite idiot, because uh, Fuzzy Dunlop and so many occasions where he has proven his idiocy. Yeah, but I think Herc's done some dumb things, but as you say, he has a certain low cunning. Whereas Ziggy just, his decisions are absurd. Like, when he tries to steal that car... And he's just, like, driving around the lot with music blaring. <laughs> yeah, I forgot like, about that. What? What are you doing? The duck. I suppose ex- Exhibit A in the case for Ziggy Zabotka would be the duck. The duck. That was pretty funny, it's... though, when he's, when he's feeding it. Look at that. Until it dies. <laughs> it's funny until the duck dies. No, but I mean, like, a lot of the time I'm like, I'm, I, I'm, I can't stand Ziggy, but that was, like, the one time I was kind of, oh, he's all right. But then he killed the duck, and I just, ended up hating him again. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's hard not to vote for Ziggy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. As much as I love him, I yeah, it's kind of obvious where both of these categories go, I think. <laughs> <laughs> as much as we want to push them into other areas, I don't think we can. So, on to the uh, patented One Night Marry Scorpions game, which this <laughs> week will be One Night Marry and either send to the pawn shop, send to the boats, or board up in the vacants. You can take your pick of which is the most horrible all right. Starting off at the courthouse, I figured we, no one wanted to see Judge Phelan on the list. So Rhonda, <laughs> <laughs> so Rhonda Perlman, uh, One Night Mario Scorpions, boys. Uh, uh, she's got a career, Mary. I feel like. Yeah, she's all right. Yeah, Mary. Yeah, I think yeah. Right. She, she's, a, she's politically minded, but I think by season five, she proves herself pretty honorable. But do yeah. you think she's become a judge by the end of season five? Do you think she's going to turn corrupt, like Phelan-like? Nah, I don't see that. I don't think so, no. Okay. Based, on the, based on the show, probably. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys are all marrying uh, Rhonda. Fantastico. The Rosas, so the poli- police, sorry. Uh, police. <laughs> McNulty. McNulty. Five hour. So One night. what I... <laughs> So, yeah, that was my first instinct, but I think, really, the thing is, if you have a one-night stand with McNulty, he's going to start showing up to your house in the middle of the night, he's going to start <laughs> calling you. What you want to do is, if you marry McNulty, he'll never be home. It's essentially the same <laughs> I think I think marrying him is actually the one-night equivalent. So, you marry McNulty, you'll have, you know, a few good weeks or whatever, and then uh, basically he'll start never coming home, and in a year or two you'll get divorced, and that'll be it. So I, I marry McNulty. <laughs> I think the way to deal with McNulty is like Terry to actually be the one, the one like he has, like to use him, like mm, his, his yeah. little his little face when he realizes that what she's gonna now do yeah, some work. <laughs> but I feel so sad for him. Yeah, but I think it's the only way. Otherwise, you're right. He's just going to be like, he's going to be turning up, knocking at your door at three in the morning with a sad face. Yeah, exactly. So we can't be going there. It's very dangerous. Um, The bunk. (laughs) (laughs) The bunk don't float. (laughs) Just a humble motherfucker with a big ass dick. Uh, it's got to be one night, isn't it? I mean, it's just like for the yeah. comedic value of seeing what shit he does. I mean, just make yeah. sure your smoke alarms are in good working yeah. order. And... There'll yeah, be a story yeah. in it, definitely. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It'll be the best yeah. anecdote you'll ever have. It'll be a good night, yeah. Lester Freeman. I mean, he's got that great sideline with the furniture there. I think that's... that's a good <laughs> You think he's a gold mine? Yeah, yeah exactly. What yeah. are you yeah. pulling in off that, then? Exactly. <laughs> Well, he, he keeps his, like, you know, 20-somethings ex-stripper girlfriend happy, so he's obviously not bad in the sack. That's true, yeah. Yeah, I, I yeah, don't know. Yeah. Is he the marrying type, though? I don't know. Yeah. He doesn't seem to be too philandering. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd marry him, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'd marry Lester. And he's also, at least pretty, you know, like, I don't, I don't feel like he would be annoying, you know, having to live with or anything. Relatively quiet, yeah. 
Yeah, just this tweedy yeah. little impertinence in the corner. <laughs> yeah. uh, just give him a little table and some balsa wood and he's off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, um, Cedric Daniels. Late season Cedric Daniels, not douchey early season Cedric Daniels. I would marry him. I think he becomes a fine man. Yeah, yeah I don't know. Like, I, I think one night for me, I think he would. I would find him a little hard to live with, I feel like. He's a little too, I don't know. He gets intense about things, and I don't really want to deal with it. He's quite austere, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, a bit, he's a bit humorless, yeah. Takes himself quite seriously. Um, Kima. Uh, Silence. <laughs> I was trying to think. Uh, it's a hard... I mean, it's between one night and Mary, obviously, but... Uh, I wouldn't marry her, because like, you'd get pregnant, mm-hmm. and then she'd be freaking out and getting drunk. Oh, I probably wouldn't, so... Well, this is true. <laughs> but, you know, modern medicine is an amazing thing. Well, that's true. You never know. You never know. <laughs> in the next ten years. <laughs> I mean, in, in the kind of alternate universe where you marry the lesbian, please. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, it's too... It's <laughs> too many addendums at this point. Involved. Okay, you uh, both complete the fifth, if you like, on chemo. Uh, I, guess, yeah. I guess it's probably one night. I feel yeah, like... One yeah, night. Yeah, 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 I, I don't guess wanna... one night. If she's into it. <laughs> well, sure. I mean, obviously, we're making the same assumption. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Herc and Carve separately or together in fact um, Herc first I, I would actually this is the first character where I would I would go to the pawn shop unit for 18 years rather than sleep with her <laughs> just for yeah, what he does you know, to Randy right you know if, if I were a woman I would really not be interested in Herc at all but I'm also like a relatively big like I feel like he would be I would be not scared exactly of him but like I would be uncomfortable having to have sex with her <laughs> Like I feel like if yeah. I were if I got uncomfortable and was like, "Hey, let's slow this down," that Herc might not listen to me. So you don't Ugh. think he'd be like funk? You don't think he'd treat you gentle because he knew it was your first time? No, no, exactly. I, I don't think that he would. It's because when it came time for you to fuck me, you were very gentle. Damn yeah, right. See, because you could haul me out of the garage and just bend me over the hood of a radio car. And, no, you were. You were very gentle. I knew it was the first time. I wanted to make that shit special. Um, as a guy, I'd I'd be okay with her, but uh, you know, if I were a woman, I, I would I would board myself up in the vacants. I think. <laughs> what if you put What if you put her and Carver together then? Is oh yeah, I definitely I'd do that. <laughs> I think that would be a night to remember. Well, it would be, but not necessarily in a good way. <laughs> oh, not necessarily. <laughs> Yeah, they'd be hilarious. It'd be great. I, I think that would be really fun. Oh, don't get me wrong. I, I would go out and get drunk with Herc and Carl. Um, Duncan, any opinions on Herc? Uh, wait, do I get boarded up in the vacants or does he? You get boarded up in the vacants. Uh, I'd First probably take the, the boat then. Up. Yeah, I'd probably ride the boat. Which finally, last but not least, Carl. And I think a late season Carl I'd marry. I think he's lovely by the end. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Mary. he's a pretty good guy by the end. I think I think probably Mary. Yeah. yeah, marriage material. Plus he's got that, you know, like super cool styling with wearing the badge around the neck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we don't Which follow. he's obviously yeah. so proud of, right? That's yeah, super thing. cool. You, you want to take that into the bedroom? <laughs> Absolutely. Just the badge. Just the badge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my word. Things you say to the public on air in a podcast yeah. that you can't take back. Um <laughs> Okie dokie. Onto the street. So let's start from the top. The king, Avon Barksdale. Mm. Yeah, one night. Yeah, yeah one night. I'd, I mean, I'd probably marry him if he's going to prison. I'll just spend his millions. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like you tie yourself too closely to Avon and somebody's going to shoot you. Whether it's him or Stringer or Marlow, somebody's going to fucking shoot you. Oh, I don't know if they'd go for his spouse. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. It's dangerous life, though. I, I don't know. I'm a little worried about it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'd certainly rather be married to him than his mistress. Yeah. But as a yeah, if it, if mistress were on there, that would be a dangerous choice, certainly. But I feel like one night, you know, you're in, you're out. Strategic strike. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's certainly better than getting. I mean, like he's not an unhandsome guy, so it's better than getting boarded up in a row house. Certainly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, string a bell. Who, because it's Idris Elba, Elba, I kind of have to recuse myself from this one because it's impossible <laughs> for me to separate the concept of Stringer Bell from Idris Elba because, you know, obviously 
Idris, I am available to be married. <laughs> <laughs> Let me leave that out there. <laughs> but over to you, gentlemen. Maybe Naaman will tell him for you. So. Yeah, exactly. Let me tweet Naaman. Yeah. <laughs> Get my man on the case. Yeah, I kind of respect Stringer, but I don't think he'd be a very pleasant person to be around, so I might take the boat. I right, too good looking not to not to take at least a one night stand. I wouldn't marry him, but incredibly yeah. good. Looking. If you marry him, he, mm. he's like really ambitious. He's gonna go places. He's really neat. Yeah, but he's yeah, so unhappy. But, yeah, and he's also. I, I don't know that he has enough. Uh, I don't think that he would care enough about me. Yeah. And as he says to D'Angelo's ex girlfriend, he is XL. <laughs> yeah, but by the end he's not even talking to her. Well, I'm not making my case very well. I think you're right. Yeah. Actually, he doesn't actually show that he's in love with anybody in the whole. Yeah, exactly. I don't. I don't have any confidence that there would be that it would be a very affectionate uh, marriage. So I think. Yeah. He no, loves money. He loves money more than anything else. Yeah. yeah. No cuddles from Stringer. Okay. <laughs> D'Angelo. Hmm. Bear in mind, he shot one of the girls, didn't he? I mean, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't really like D'Angelo. I think I'd, uh, I think I'd go to the pawn shop unit. Whoa. Yeah, I really, I don't, I don't like him. That much? I mean, that's like, okay, give us your reasons for why you hate him that much. Uh, I mean, a, a lot of it is, I, I don't know, I. I don't like the way he looks. I, that seems ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, visual. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, I mean, everybody else is sort of like, even if they're you know a little little chunkier, like like the bunk or something like that. You know, at least if he looks, you know, he's fun or whatever. Like D'Angelo, I don't. Uh, he's quite whiny, isn't he? In a way. Yeah, he's annoying. Like I don't, I don't want to hang out with D'Angelo. I don't know. I was gonna say Mary, but. Yeah, he is kind of annoying. Um, <laughs> I guess if he sort of got out of the drug trade and we we went into witness protection, maybe we could have a happy life. Yeah, because he whines about being in the drug trade, right? So. Yeah, he's really suffocated by it. I think he really doesn't like it, and that's why he's so unhappy. But if he got out, maybe he could find some peace. Well, that's a, that's this is the hardest one yet, and I didn't think it would be. I I didn't even, I didn't even think about. I don't like him either, really. I don't love him. Uh, yeah. I'm genuinely surprised, I actually, because I thought he was one of the most, more sympathetic character arcs in the first two seasons. But oh, On sorry. the first watch through, I didn't like him, but I think I like him a lot more in previous um, watches. Sorry, I don't want to I think I don't want marry him. So, yeah. no, I think it's I think it's pawn shop. I think I agree. Gosh, you guys are like, you have high standards. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe, maybe it's because he came right after Stringer Bell. This is true. Everyone suffers after it's, yeah. it's true. Mm. Um, bubbles. Ah, oh, Bubbles. Oh, I would marry Bubbles and I'd reform him and like feed him three meals a day and keep him safe. And yeah, I'd, I'd marry him, give him a shower and <laughs> help him get to sleep. Each <laughs> give night. him a shower and then marry him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he can climb my stairs any day. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's so cute. I don't know. I, I prefer I prefer someone to take care of me. So I'm not sure. Bubble <laughs> seems like seems like trouble waiting to happen. I'll I'll go for a night because you know he's he's sort of a charming guy. But I don't think I wanna I don't think I wanna marry him. I think we can dispatch Marlow pretty quickly. Yeah, <laughs> it's not even like taking the choice of being boarded up in the vacants because he would board you up in the vacants. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, just keep a white berth. Um, Prop Joe, who I jokingly put in there. Uh, I'd marry Prapto. He's a wise guy, right? I love Prapto. Yeah. Yeah, yeah he seems like an okay guy. And he'd be good around the house, because he can fix stuff. Oh, shit. <laughs> I didn't even think about that. Yeah. Absolutely. Definitely marry Prapto. Yeah, he's handy. Um, okay, cool. Any other characters you want to do? or Colonel Rawls, I assume no one would. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Actually, i tell you who, I'd marry Bunny Colvin. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Or if we had an, an option, like, pick someone to be your dad. He'd be, <laughs> yeah. he'd be the coolest, like, dad. Yeah, absolutely. What I'd about marry... Beedy? Would any of you guys, like, marry or one night with Beedy? Yeah, I'd marry Beedy. One night, I don't want the the kid thing. seems like an encumbrance. So I'm not interested. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> so we're getting that Michael basically wants a woman with like no baggage who's just yeah, being yeah, exactly. about caring. Very, very <laughs> Take care of him. Yeah. He's easy on the eyes. Um, right. <laughs> <laughs> ladies, Fair feel free to send in your CVs. <laughs> <laughs> How about Prez? Mary Prez, right? Yeah. 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 I'd marry Liz yeah, yeah. in Prez. Yeah, Liz. Yeah. Early season, God knows, the guy would probably wind up accidentally shooting you or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, politicians. Clay Davis and Tommy Carcetti. Yeah. Like, get away from both of them. Mm. Yeah. Although, if you're Mrs. Clay Davis, you're going to be really rich. Yeah, but you have to live with him. She yeah, but he's going to be on the road campaigning. <laughs> <laughs> okay, everyone has to now do their shit impression one by one. Uh, <laughs> so I can comedically cut it in some like, various points of the podcast. It doesn't really work in an English accent, I don't think. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't really work with any uh, accent other than the one uh, that he has. I mean, it's got to be his voice, because it's so hot. It's so yeah, deep. exactly. Yeah, he does a, he does a great job. Ain't gonna come talk me about money laundering in West Baltimore? Shit. I said, now that you mention it, I want to hear it in an English accent. But you can't even do it. You just can't do that long set of eyes. It just doesn't... I don't even... I don't know, Will, do you want to give it a go? Um, it's difficult to do it in an English accent, because you do you do think about doing it in an American accent. Yeah, it would just sound like, like, it, it'd be like when Yeah, it'd be like, sheet. <laughs> 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 oh, that was pretty good. <laughs> that was well worth it. Oh, that was legendary. Okay. Oh man, I just need a few moments to recover from that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm going into a giggling fit. Not good. Okay. Calm. Right. Okay. So then, finally, um, Song of Ice and Fire character house equivalents. I mean, we've done a little bit of this, haven't we? Someone put Valchek as Walder Frey. Yeah, that was yeah, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> Explain yourself, Duncan. I I just thought he was so sort of petulant and harboured all these petty slights and uh, you know, he's so vicious yeah, against cool. people who um and he just looks so like horrible and weird. Yeah. yeah no offense to the actor, but I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you could have almost cast. I mean, he's a little too big, maybe, but you could almost cast him as Walter Frey. And he does have his little petty fiefdom in the in the northwest or whatever it is. Yeah, exactly. Or southwest, yeah. yeah. That totally works, actually. Yeah. yeah, that's really yeah. good. I didn't see it either when I when I read it. But yeah, he's very spiteful. Yeah, I mean, he's he's not very powerful, but he has some power. He uses he he, he, has he gets his friends. revenge from the higher ups. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he knows how to work his powerful friends. I also yeah. love the way like there's that little bit where um, when Herc confides in him about the whole Royce blowjob thing, and then. He advises Herc, but to, he'll have leverage over Herc, who has leverage over Royce. So he is like Walder Frey. He knows how to, like, parlay a small bit of information and power into something much bigger. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's politically sad. So who put Omar equals Beric Dondarrion? Is that... Yeah, that was me. Um, just, yeah, Robin Hood figure, free agent. Um, doesn't belong to any particular clan, just kind of robs from both of them. Oddly badass. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I'm buying that. Yeah, what's up? I thought McNulty is Tyrion because of his drinking and womanizing and his constant um, thinking he's the smartest man in the room and and probably usually being right. Yeah, um, I yeah. have that one as it's well. It's not bad. Yeah, and I um, guess if you I see have... Rawls as like uh, Tywin, <laughs> kind of this Machiavellian figure. Yeah, not as smart as Tywin, but sort of the same. Yeah. Well, he's sort he's pretty man. smart. I mean, he no, no, no. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not saying he's dumb. I'm just saying that Tywin's really, really, really fucking smart. But the cool efficiency, yeah. definitely. I mean, he definitely... yeah, and and almost cruelty. Yeah. I had the Aiden Gillen connection of Carcetti and Littlefinger. Yeah, I agree. Political fixes on the inside, unlikely rises to power. Yes, it was the unlikely rises to power that kind of got me with that. But it's it's, it's slightly tenuous, but it's 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 vague. Mm. I think the problem is we haven't got enough female characters in the wire to um, cross-sect with some of and fire characters. That's, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. What, Snoop is Arya? Trainee assassin? Messed Ooh, up childhood? That's harsh. Yeah. Oh, I don't think... Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I was, I was thinking more... Um, I was thinking Arya more as Michael. 
Yeah, okay. With someone take successive people taking her under their wings and mm-hmm. up. yeah, that works. Yeah, well, she yeah. she loses all her family and eventually just becomes like a free agent and, and, and kills and takes yeah. what she wants. But does yeah. so with still a heart, a good heart in part, like when Michael's with, killing people but yeah. having to feed Dookie. Yeah, with a, with a bit of moral centre. Yeah. yeah. Actually, that works quite well. Yeah, I like that one. Um, you see, I thought hmm. of Bunk as more of Tyrion. Oh, okay. Because yeah. Bunk's cleverer than McNulty. And has more of a moral centre than McNulty, I think. And um, yeah, but Bunk Bunk doesn't really get taken down like McNulty does. McNulty just rages against the system and gets taken down constantly, and carries that bitterness over into his relationships. Oh, okay. And you see that, yeah, that bitterness in Tyrion. Okay. Yeah, yeah I'm buying it. Yeah. What about the Queen of Thorns as um, D'Angelo's mum? Oh, hmm. manipulative. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the Queen of Thorn kind of at, at present we think is using her power to protect Marjorie, but we don't know yet how that's all going to play out. And I would say that um, in sending Quinton off to on a sketchy mission, I would say Delonda and Naaman. <laughs> 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 like putting your kid out to do something that he can obviously yeah. get messed up with just to further your own political ends. Oh, Marlowe's got to be uh, Roos or Ramsey Bolton. Yeah, oh, no doubt, no doubt. Yeah, Very yeah, cold, sadistic, Ramsey, yeah. I would say Roos, actually. Yeah. Roos seems a bit more yeah. cold, a bit more kind of quietly yeah. beautiful. That's true, yeah, yeah. And Marlo doesn't seem to be, I mean, have like a torture basement or anything, as far as we know anyway. I don't know, maybe he does. Uh, what about um, uh, Bubbles as Davos? Maybe, kind of, you know, he's got some sort of moral centre. He grew up really poor in Flea Bottom. Kind of hustles his way from port to port. Yeah, sort of like early Davos, like Davos the Smuggler almost. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. And he kind of, he kind of redeems himself after that, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, what about uh, Bunny as um, Jon Snow? He tries to kind of reform the, the system and make friends with his enemies. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. And yeah, just ends good. up creating mm-hmm. Amsterdam at the wall. <laughs> and then just gets crucified by his own people. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really good. I really like that. Uh, that works. Okay, well, if no more character equivalents, and some of it done the wire jargon quiz, like what, what's a re-up? What do hoppers do? Oh, uh, yeah, I found a couple of terms on the internet. I don't know if we want to do a little quiz. But, like, who, who is there anyone else amongst us who now just regularly uses re-up? Like, if you're at work and you go for a coffee, it's like, does anyone want a re-up? <laughs> <laughs> I do, and I yeah. just look at me blank. I can't, yeah, I can't. I kind of use it instead of, like, refill, real. Yeah, I do. And then kind of, yeah. like, you know, talk about, you know, going to the connect. <laughs> yeah, the I, use, I probably use the word indeed way too much as well. I think, in general, I just don't live my life with the level of verbal eloquence that the characters in the wires have. Yeah. And that's a shame. Yeah. That, that's a shame. <laughs> um, but, yeah, no, if you want to do a wire jargon quiz and you have a list of words, then go for it. Otherwise, I think we're kind of done. Oh, well, I'll, I'll read out a couple, see if you guys know what they are. I don't know. Okay. You probably know by now, but, but I think that was kind of the fun of starting the series, not knowing all these terms. So uh, what about um, go go to the mattresses? That's from The Godfather, right? It's, yeah, it's Godfather. That's old school. Oh, okay. Maybe it's... Yeah. It's basically it's a gang war or whatever. Yeah, to go to war or to, or to yeah. close with. Um mm-hmm. Rolling bones? It's dice, yeah. Dice, yeah. Yeah, or, yeah, playing crafts. Um, uh, what's a hopper? It's a little kid, right? Who's just dealing on the corner. Yeah, it's a. Uh, the hoppers. I'm not sure. Is the hopper specifically the one that runs to the to the stash to pick it up, or not? It's a young boy or a girl of the generation below corner boys on the fringes of the drug trade, and they usually okay. serve as uh, lookouts. Yeah. Oh, lookouts. Uh, okay, so it is. It's no. Yeah. I thought they were the corner boys, basically, but no. The corner boys are like the dealers, but yeah, the the um the hoppers are like a step below. They 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 yell five zero and all that. They're the ones who who yell Omar coming, Omar coming. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which is um, another thing I need to do in the office more when like the head boss is like coming on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Omar coming, Omar coming yeah. <laughs> click off your Facebook and APOIF forums page. <laughs> on your screen, get the spreadsheets back up. Pretend shut it down. <laughs> 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 oh well, what's the game? It's an obvious one. The drug deal. The drug trade. Yeah, yeah. Well, the life of a drug dealer and um, have this acknowledgement of a different set of rules and ethics. Um, and last one, 
uh, what's a what's the stash? The drugs. Drugs. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, the drugs concealed um, in security. Yeah, in a warehouse or something. Like that. No, that wasn't too hard. Yeah. <laughs> you, you guys are experts. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. That's that's you know, it's a useful life skill. I feel. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I think I think the one thing that the wire taught me more than anything other is that you don't pronounce police police but police. Um well, unless anyone has any other burning points that they wanted to make, I guess we can wrap up. So, I just want to say a massive thank you to everyone for joining me for like 3 hours of wire discussion. No, it's a ton of fun. Thanks for coming up with the ideas. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's great. great. Real indulgence. It's so much fun to talk about it because um, yeah. I just don't think that many people in England certainly know about it as well as other shows. And um, I just think it's the best show of all time. I really do. Yeah, no, I, I think so too. Yeah. It's really one of my favorite, I, very favorite, probably. I agree. Yeah, best show. Cool. And um, I guess I should also make a shout out that if any of you listening want to um, come up with a Vassals of Kingsgrave topic and get it going, then please do make a suggestion and put it on the forums there's even like a calendar now that we try and use so please feel free to participate um be fun to have you guys all record and contribute so with that thanks very much for listening good night fiends good night fiends good night hoppers good night hoppers good night hustlers good night hustlers good night scammers good night scammers good night to everybody Good night to everybody. Good night to one and all. Good night to one and all. a lot guys especially to Duncan I don't know is it like 7 or 8 o'clock in the morning now yeah it's 8 o'clock now so I'm good to go <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. craziness I feel really bad for you like in Australia it's always going to be the sucky time basically that's right it's always you guys are always around the same time but it's like the opposite in Australia yeah being yeah, British is yeah. so awesome Greenwich Mean Time <laughs> right in the middle yeah <laughs> Okay. We, we've never had a sports one. I feel we need. Have to we play. not? No. Yeah. Or maybe when it's a bit further in the season, because we've got like a fantasy soccer league. Do one on that. But that's, I'm only saying that because I'm winning at the moment. <laughs> 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 Which yeah. is like, I got my neighbour, who's like a seven-year-old kid, to pick my team, so I don't actually know much about soccer. And it's doing really well. <laughs> There's like a small window of opportunity <laughs> when I'm winning because like now he's back at school, so I can't like like go around and say who should I substitute into my team because I'm gonna look like the friendly neighbourhood paedophile if I keep. <laughs> cool. I have to say, like, is this like stupid anecdote? One of like my proudest um, retweets was when I was bigging up this like tiny little independent movie. And the guy who plays Naaman, I think, had a small part in it, and he retweeted my positive review. <laughs> oh, my God, Naaman retweeted me. <laughs> I was like, this poor what kid. You <laughs> probably get the... What was the movie? Um, yeah. Oh, God, I've got total mind blight now. <laughs> Naaman is not going to appreciate this. <laughs>